The opinions and viewpoints expressed in .NET Rocks are not necessarily those of its sponsors or of Microsoft Corporation, its partners, or employees. .NET Rocks is a production of Franklin's Net, which is solely responsible for its content. Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter. Rockheads, cluster your indexes later and listen up. It's time for another stellar episode of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers with Carl Franklin and Rory Blythe. This is Jeff Maciolik here to announce show number 74 with guest Kimberly Tripp, recorded live Thursday, July 29th. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net training developers to work smarter, and now offering hands-on VBNet and ASPNet classes remotely, online at www.franklins.net, and by Data Dynamics, makers of ActiveReports.net, simple, powerful, and cost-effective reporting for Windows Forms and ASPNet web applications, online at www.datadynamics.com, and by Dundas Chart. Advanced technology, advanced results. Online at www.dundaschart.com. Support is also provided by Code Magazine, Microsoft Technologies in-depth for IT managers and developers. Online at www.code-magazine.com. And now, the man who asks, is that a dynamic partition in your pocket or are you just happy to see me? Carl Franklin! Digital blood without any pain. Oh yeah! Gotta get enough points. That's what I'm talking about. Welcome to .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin, and we got a good one for you tonight, folks. Uh, but before we talk about that, let's bring out our co-star. You know him as Rory. I know him as Rory. Now we know him as Mr. Microsoft, Rory Blythe. How you doing, man? Hey, it was uh, pretty was, good. You know, to- totally overwhelmed, but I'm good. You uh, You went to work for the collective today. I haven't actually started my first day, so I'm not officially working, and there's still a matter of this background check that has to go through, so I have some people to pay off and some people to bump (laughs) off and stuff like that. If I can do that quickly enough, then the background check is going to pass, and I'm going to go in for my employee uh, orientation sometime What if they find out about that little tryst you did with the Communist Party in the 60s, you know? Then I think you're really totally screwed. They're not going to find out about it, are they, Carl? (laughs) I can get that edited out of the final show, and I'll have you bumped off, and I'll have everybody who listened to this bumped off, and then nobody's going to know about it. No, one way or another, I'm going to work at Microsoft. One time you shacked up with Castro, you know, and he gave you those cigars, and then you guys went out drinking, and oh, yeah, that was a horrible night. Yeah. Well, Well, Castro, the long haired chihuahua puppy, is on my lap right now. So (laughs) I do spend a lot of time with Castro, but yeah, I I am really excited. Yeah. So um, and those, and for, for those of you, who I guess don't, for anybody who, blah blah. Sorry. Well, about I that. guess yeah. For 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 anybody for anybody who wants to know what it is that I'm actually going to be doing, um, I'm going to be an MSDN presenter, and the idea behind that is I'm going to go sort of from town to town in the Pacific Northwest and present with a team of other Microsoft people on a range of technical topics, and I think the schedule right now has some like ASP.NET two stuff on there, and uh, cool. Some other items. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be pretty cool. I mean, this is kind of what I really, really wanted to be doing. And to actually find a job, to find somebody, to find that somebody's willing to pay me to do what I really want to do is really exciting. So it's been a good week. And I got a whole bunch of uh, emails and IMs from people who are saying, you know, now that Mike uh, Rory works for the man, what, uh, you know, what does that mean for <laughs> .NET Rocks? And it just means more publicity. I think that's what it means. In fact... You were telling me uh, today that, you know, you asked them, you know, what about all your, all your extracurricular activities, right? And what did they say? I think that, uh, let's see, in one of the early phone interviews, um, the question was raised, well, you know, what about the blog? And I was like, well, what about the blog? That's really, uh, I mean, obviously, I still want to write it, but it's kind of 
up to you guys that there's going to have to be some sort of a limitation. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. We were just afraid you might stop writing it. <laughs> so they're actually being very, they're being very uh, lenient with all of that. And they're being very cool about it. And obviously, obviously, I have encouraging to, you. Yeah. Right. And I have to continue to be a nice guy in person. You know, because now I do kind of, I am going to be representing Microsoft to a certain extent since I'm part of the company, well, so I can't like show up places with my underwear on my head yeah, and, and you totally are nice, drunk and you are putting nice my cigar on the avocado dip or something like that. <laughs> yeah, in person I am a nice guy, so it's not going to be that hard. Yeah, it's not going to be a big change, so yeah. I'm excited. You have a poison pen from time to time, but in person you're a sweetheart, so. <laughs> yeah. So cool. So that's pretty cool. So, uh, so what's up with you? What's up with me? Well, um, I've been doing a lot of things. I've been actually spending a lot of time this week preparing for the the uh, .NET Rocks tablet PC listener giveaway, um, putting up yeah. a page and and uh, and let me tell people about that. You've probably seen it if you if you if you've been to our site recently, but if you haven't and you're listening from the MSDN download site or something like that, we're giving away a tablet PC, and it all started like this. And I don't mind telling you the story. We were out at Microsoft, and we were, uh, you know, asking them to help us out with some more bandwidth for next year. And they've been graciously helping us this year with bandwidth uh, relief. And um, you know, they said what we really want to do this year is we want to know like what your listeners and what developers are interested in. We don't necessarily need to know their names, their email addresses. They don't need personal information, but they want to know what people are using, what languages they're using. They want to know what technologies they're interested in. They want to know how big their departments are, that kind of stuff. So uh, I said, well, I'd be glad to collect some of that stuff, but you know, I don't want to make it mandatory for people to have to fill out a form to download the show. So give me something to give away. And they said, well, like what? And I said, how about a tablet PC? And they said, done. So great. I got this tablet PC to give away. All you got to do is go to www.franklins.net slash DNR. Well, just go to .NET Rocks slash .NET Rocks. Right there, there's a link to the Tablet PC giveaway page. And uh, it's a fully loaded 1 gig of RAM, 1.8 gigahertz, 60 gig, 7200 RPM drive, 1400 by 1050 screen. It's convertible. It's got the pen. It's got, it's a sexy mother right there. I'm actually ready to quit um, Franklin's Net and Microsoft so that I can enter. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it was funny. I was talking with Chris Sells right right as I was about to launch it. <laughs> oh, I was yeah. chatting with him. <laughs> and I said, uh, hey, check this out. And he goes, cool, maybe I can win that. And I said, oh, yeah, I forgot to put in the disclaimer that you can't because you work for Microsoft. So he says, okay, well, can I blog it? Sure. So he blogs it. And, of course, the title is Crappy Carl Gives Away a Crappy Tablet PC. <laughs> In his crappy contest. <laughs> you don't have to even crappy <laughs> listen to his crappy show to crappy win. And people from crappy Microsoft can't win. Isn't that crappy? <laughs> I liked Chris's subtle use of spite to get his point across. <laughs> you know? Oh, that's great. So, I love yeah, that post, I, though. And I actually yeah. put in the disclaimer that, you know, employees of Microsoft, Franklin's Net, and SellsBrothers.com are not eligible. So there you go. Of course, salesbrothers.com has exactly one employee. <laughs> right. you know. or in other words, employees of Microsoft, Franklin's.net, and Chris Sells cannot Sells. enter the tablet yeah, contest. Right. But he yeah. works for Microsoft anyway. We just wanted to be very yeah. sure that he understood that. Well, anyway, um, hey, Richard, are you out there? Yeah, I'm out here somewhere. Well, good, uh, because we got some mail this week. Um, actually, last week, and I didn't see it because it was in the .NET Rocks folder, but... But anyway, I wanted you to hear this and react to it. It's from Steve Scott. And he says, hi, guys. Great show. Keep up the good work. Now that you have Richard Campbell on regularly, you may get a moment where you can ask him about a fight he had to skip from Amsterdam to home after just a little too much of a local beverage that I can no longer remember the name of. It was some kind of schnapps the night before. The next morning, after about one hour's sleep, I have never seen someone who was still alive look so white. The trip in the taxi to the airport was what you might call nervy, not ever being sure the window would make it down in time. When I left him sprawled out, yeah. taking up a couple of sofas in the Air Canada first class lounge to, cup to catch my flight to London, I wasn't sure he was going to make it. I later learned that he abandoned the lounge for a hotel and caught a flight home the next day. Anyway, it was a good night out. <laughs> God. <laughs> Sound like you had a little fun yeah, there. Yeah, that 
that is the one time I was the closest to actually wishing I was dead. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so weird because, you know, you don't look like a party animal to, to look at you. You know, you're, you're a well, home you know, guy. Well, you know, it was those darn Dutch people. The Dutch people did it to me. They lied. The, the booze is called Yaniva. And they said, no, go oh, ahead, man. try some. No hangover. Don't worry. No hangover at all. So apparently no one had ever seen anybody drink quite as much Yaniva as I managed to drink that night. Oh, man. Wow. Well, anyway, uh, Rory, I got some other mail this week, and uh, I'd like to read a few of those. Yep. And actually, we had okay. I had problems like printing because the printer didn't have uh, uh, ink, and I couldn't figure that out. So I just brought my tablet PC into the studio, and I have them all right here. So I'm just going to read them you know, as if they were printed out. It's very cool. See, the tablet PC is saving paper already. And the first one comes from Daniel Wellesley, and he says, Hey, Carl, Rory, and Jeff, I've finally downloaded and listened to... Hey, he didn't, he didn't say Richard there. Oh, well. I finally downloaded and listened to all of your shows to date. My brain hurts and I need a new hard drive. I told a colleague about your show and he asked me, what's it about? But the only thing I could remember is that all the whacked out Google weirdos and the fact that Bill Vaughn really doesn't like Jet. Seriously, I got a lot out of DNR and it is a great resource that is one of a kind. I just wanted to relay a tip for all those listeners out there who can't catch up but think that the 90 hours of back listening may be a challenge. Uh, if you're using Windows Media Player, a later version, try changing the play speed settings to something faster, like one t- one point four or one point eight times faster. Sometimes even crank it up to two times faster if you got one of them slow talkers on. The Google Weirdos theme song is a must heard at two times speed and at half speed too. <laughs> hmm. I love the Dutch Tavern episode. Would love another one, but next time make it an all nighter. I want to hear you guys trashed and heckling the other patrons. <laughs> <laughs> quote, <laughs> quote, yeah, I bet you use C++, don't you, pal? Go wash your hair, you jackass. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly before we all get our asses kicked by regular people. Yeah. Right, right. And uh, another one here is from Brian Russell, and he's in the UK. He says, Carl and Rory, thanks for putting out such a great show on .NET. Having recently discovered .NET Rocks, I'm working my way through the archives and have found it one of the most entertaining and informative sources of information for .NET. I can identify with a DIY guy you told us about listening to .NET Rocks from his PDA over his WLAN. This guy's like Mr. Acronym here. Uh, I was doing much (laughs) the same thing the other weekend while decorating my bathroom. Maybe you should tie in some sponsorship with Deluxe. My choice of... Uh, Deluxe is a soap in the UK. My choice of player was a little more low-tech, though, an aging P133 laptop. In between my day job and evangelizing .NET here, I'm studying for my MCAD MCSD in C Sharp. Could we have a future show on this topic, please? I've heard varying opinions on the worth of the exams, and it would be good to get your views on this. Any tips, of course, would be a great help. Cheers, Brian. So, well... Here's my, I don't know what you think about this, uh, Roy. I don't know what you think about this, Roy, but my views are um, those certifications are good if you're trying to get a job. I don't know. I think that those certifications are good if if what you're trying to do is ensure that you have at least like broad exposure to a lot of key concepts that you're going to encounter on a daily basis. Um, But I think that a lot of employers that I've talked to are kind of iffy. Some of them say, yeah, I like to see those uh, certifications. And some of them say, you know, I actually count the certifications no matter where they're from, no matter what they're for, as a right. hit against the person. Yeah, I I, do, but, um, I would do the same. Yeah. yeah, but I like the idea of the certifications as a personal way of making sure that you're really on top of things. And that's what I was going to use them for myself, just to make sure that you, you didn't miss anything, that you had all the key points covered. Right. I actually think that they're better for... Uh, things that are non-developer related where, you know, using a particular program, there's one way to use it and that's it or one or two ways. Yeah. Um, with development, of course, you know, every keystroke is another decision and, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an art form as well as something that you have to know like where all the options are in the tools menu, you know? Yeah. Um, so, so anyway. Well, a certification says that you, might know about the technology, but that doesn't actually mean you're a good coder. That's, That's the right. problem with yeah. it. But for other technologies, so, I think it, they can be pretty useful. Yeah. 
And that is that for the mail. So now we quickly move on to the news of the week with Rory Blythe. Rory, Mr. Microsoft, I'm so badass, and you're not. Blythe. Now obey. So you got some news for us this week, Rory? I do have some news. Not tons, but I got a little bit here, just enough to kind of, you know, wet your whistle. So the first thing that I'm going to talk about... Oh, and first of all, before I get into any of the news, this week I'm... I've used tinyurl.com to shorten those three mile long URLs and make them uh, digestible rather than just gigantic. So that ought to make oh, some cool. people happy. Cool. That's just where they're too long, where they're still normal size. I'm using the real URL, but you know, tiny URL is there to help us out. So the first article that I'm going to point your attention to is an interview with the guy at Sun who pretty much came up with Project Looking Glass. And Project Looking Glass is this pseudo oh, yeah. 3D desktop that I have some issues with. You sort and of ranked on feels, it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not happy with it because it strikes me as being sort of like innovation just for the sake of innovation. It doesn't necessarily make anything better. In my opinion, it actually makes a lot of things a little bit more confusing. And it worries me when I see people pushing forward just to make something because it feels innovative. I, I, I don't really care for that. But the link to the article is tinyurl.com slash 6JPS2, slash 6JPS2. So how's that for you? That's a lot easier. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about the article. Uh, you can just go on ahead and read it. I've been keeping an eye on it. So I thought okay. other people might like to Sounds hear a little good. bit about that too. And then the next one that I've got here is kind of a cool deal. It's the Great Gadget Smackdown, Windows <laughs> versus Linux. And uh, the URL cool. for this is tinyurl.com slash 5 BS7T slash 5BS7T. Hmm. And this is pretty cool. What what they're doing is uh, LinuxDevices.com is getting into a fight with uh, this embedded Windows site over which platform has the best embedded devices. And it seems to be, you know, it's all in good humor. They're getting along. They're not really taking any super swipes at each other. But it's pretty cool because you get to go find these lists of PDAs and tablets and uh, robots and mobile phones and whatever that are running either Linux or Windows. And it's kind of fun to see which gadgets you might be using uh, are running a particular operating system. That's always kind of that fun. That sounds really cool. Yeah, so that's a fun little thing to go take a look at. The next thing that I wanted to tell you about, um, I, I, this isn't really programming related, but it's nerd related, right? Now, the more time that I spend in airports, the more retro arcades that I see. Yeah. Right, you go into these airports and you'll see like a Ms. Pac-Man game out, and you'll see uh, Joust and whatever. And I'm right. getting the feeling that that these retro arcades are sort of the classic rock stations of a generation. You know, instead of turning on the radio and listening to you know the Beach Boys or something, my generation, our generations, are tuning in and downloading emulators and playing the games of their of their youths and teenage years. And there's this really cool magazine that's called Retro Gamer Magazine that I found down at Powell's Technical. And which is a technical bookstore here in Portland. It's out of the UK, this magazine is, and they're just about to switch to a 12 issue a year format. And it's just a really great magazine. They go over all sorts of old platforms, um, console and computer. And it's, it's just fun stuff. It's just a lot of fun. It's a nice warm feeling. And the URL for that is tinyurl.com slash 4GC88 slash 4GC88. And that isn't to say that <laughs> that repeats itself. I'm repeating it so that you oh, will be able oh, to type oh, it in. Okay. Yeah. And then finally, we have one last bit of news. And this is incredible the way this thing here just snuck up on everybody. Have you heard of Iron Python? Uh, no, I haven't. All right. Well, Iron Python was was just announced, just released, source code and everything. Uh, reading off the webpage, Iron Python is a new Python implementation targeting the .NET and Mono platforms. It is fast. Iron Python is up to 1.7 times faster than Python 2.3 on the standard PyStone benchmark. It integrates with the common language runtime. It is fully dynamic. It's optionally static. It is managed and verifiable. So Iron Python, according to the website, generates verifiable assemblies with no dependencies on native binaries that can run wow. in environments which require verifiable managed code. Wow. And also, um, finally, and this is the least cool feature, it's not finished. But 
The mm. source code is available, and it's really a cool thing. And if somebody can come up with a way to get this hosted inside of other applications and and other really cool uh, setups for it. I mean, you can actually do ASP.NET in Python now. This is almost great for the people who miss the total simplicity of VB and felt like VBNet was a little bit too complicated for them and they don't really want to use JScript because they don't like, uh, I don't know, semicolons or curly braces. <laughs> Python, would be a, Python would be a good alternative. So the URL for that is www.ironpython.com. And I highly recommend that you go take a look at it. Very cool. So that sounds it's funny. Not, it, it's not, yeah. Yeah, it's not ready for production yet. You know, it's still research style stuff going on, but it's still a cool project. Definitely something to keep your eye on. Sounds great. So that's the news for the week. Awesome. As always. Now obey. You know, somebody was commenting that our, the, the news theme song sounds like it's clipping, and that's actually an effect uh, called vinyl, opcode vinyl, that uh, you can make songs, digital songs, sound like they're playing on a 45 or a 33 with scratches and pops and all sound degradation and things like that. It's really, hmm. really fun, so I thought I'd put that in there. And apparently uh, just sounds like it's clipping. <laughs> so, oh well. Well, anyway, um, before we introduce Kim, uh, and I'm really excited about this, uh, I wanted to mention that uh, since last week's show with Jeff Richter, um, we got a couple of emails from people. I won't say a couple. We actually got four or five emails from people who were concerned about his comments that he made about VBNet and uh, you know that it's, he didn't think it was going away, although I had heard that that was what he thought or he hopes it will, kind of. Um, but that, you know, that the languages are diverging and VBNet is going to get slower and more, more, you know, rapid application development features and C Sharp is going to get faster and C Sharp is fast and VBNet is slow and all this stuff. For example, I got this one. Uh, during, Carl, during the Jeff Richter show, Jeff said that MS is on the verge of making VBNet a rad tool, uh, thus a performance hit. Is this true? We're struggling with our tool decisions, C, C, C Sharp or VB. These types of rumors can be very persuasive, especially when coming from an expert like Jeff. I'd like to hear your view on tool selection. Well, uh, we did better than that. We actually have Jay Rocks and Paul Vick from the Microsoft VBNet team on the phone to answer those questions themselves. Jay and Paul, you out there? Yep. Yeah. Hey, Carl. Hey. How's it going? Great. Thanks for uh, stopping by and clearing up this little uh, little issue. No problem at all. Love yeah. the show. <laughs> How you guys doing, first of all, out there in Redmond? Summer well, has arrived in Seattle, which is always a great time to be out here. What has arrived? Summer. Oh, oh summer, right. You're two weeks of non-rain, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Two weeks of air conditioning sales and uh, yeah. and um, major... Uh, uh, ah, Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's amazing the one day that it hits 94... Yeah. How many people you see walking out of Target carrying a fan? Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, um, so I take it you were listening to the show last week, and um, Jeff uh, Richter made some comments about VBNet, and uh, we got a few emails, as you heard me say before, and uh, we just like to clear up the issues. Um, statement number one that uh, he denied, but I had actually heard before, was that he he kind of thinks that VBNet is going away, and of course that's silly. Or, or it's not going away, but you know eventually people will stop using it and then come over and see the light and and uh, you know go to C sharp, which is what they should be doing. I mean, I mean, I kind of think that he thinks that. Well, I I don't want to put words in Jeff's mouth, but there. I do want to let people know that Microsoft is completely one hundred percent committed to VB. Right now we've got over 100 people on the VB team by the time you do dev, test, UE, documentation, support, committed to the product. And we're spending a tremendous amount of time and resources innovating in this product for WIDB. And we're seeing more and more areas within Microsoft, such as even within parts of Visual Studio, where people are using VB for development. So we're very committed to this language, and we think it's got a tremendous future. And we know that there are a lot of people out there who are depending on it for their apps. 
Yeah, it seems to me it's like, you know, it's a, it's very easy to use. It's easy to work with. It, it's very, you know, quick to develop with. And that, you know, the, the people who like it and who use it almost think it's too good to be true. And there when people throw stones at it, you know, they begin to believe it a little bit. But you actually have uh, departments and, and people inside Microsoft that are developing Microsoft software with VB dot, VB.NET? Well, portions of Visual Studio and the .NET framework are developed using VB. Mm-hmm. And there are a couple of other groups. And then a lot of the internal groups within Microsoft are using VB.net for their development. Oh, that's great. And you, as you know, or may not know, Dan Appleman, you know, noted guru of VB and C++ for that matter, uh, recently released a, uh, a uh, you know, his whole suite of .net tools at Desaware. And, you know, these are hardcore tools. And, of course, they're all written in VB.net, and it comes with a VB.net source code. So... You know, if it's in, in, you know, NASA is one of his customers and they use it to write simulation software for, you know, the space shuttle. So, uh, you know, if it's good enough for NASA, come on. I mean, it's just a silly kind of argument. So the other thing. I'd heard that Dan and Desaware were going to release the source for their controls, which I think is very cool, which is very cool. Yeah. Well, they, you buy it, of course, but it's, you get the source. So, Yeah. Uh, the other thing that um, Jeff said, and uh, maybe Paul can answer this, sure. is that um, you know he th- he said that it's inherent C sharp is inherently faster than VBNet today, which I told him I don't believe, and uh, and I've seen the the tests to prove that it's not true, sure. and and the other thing is that he said there's going to be a separation over time or a divergence where VBNet will become more of a rad tool. And, you know, in C Sharp will we'll stay, you know, the way it is or, or whatever or get more for component development or something like that. So can you address that? Sure. Well, you know, actually, I haven't talked to Jeff about what he was specifically thinking when he was saying that. But this kind of thing has come up, comes up occasionally now and again on the Internet, bounces around. Um, so we certainly have addressed it many times so far. Yeah. Um, and the first thing I always say is, you know, VB programmers are just like any other programmers. Like, they care about how fast their applications run. Yeah. And, you know, if you're like a Fortune 500 company writing, you know, line of business application in VB.net, it doesn't matter if it takes half the time to develop if it runs twice as slow as anything else. Right. So it is really important to us that VB apps are as fast as possible and that you get really good performance when you use our tool. So that's kind of a general comment. Okay. But um, usually when these kind of things come up, it's usually sort of um, somebody looks at something that sort of looks similar in VB and C Sharp. You know, you get something. Actually, the example that comes up a lot is like uh, converting strings to integers. Oh, right. And what you end up, usually what happens is it's an area where VB provides a little more functionality than C Sharp does. So, like, if you use the intrinsic conversion in VB to convert a string to a number, we're going to... We'll recognize decimal points. We'll recognize thousands converter, uh, thousand separators. Mm-hmm. We'll recognize currency symbols. So, you know, we give you a lot of functionality. C whereas, int, you mean? You, int, yeah. What are in, integers? Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas most C sharp users will call like the system dot convert class two int thirty two, and right. that just converts digits. Anything else, it'll throw an exception. Right. So, but you, but with, a VB programmer could use that as well. Sure, and that was yeah. that's just the point. So basically, in in every case that we've seen in the in, in when these sort of this sort of question comes up, is it's like there's a VB way that has more functionality, there's a C sharp way that has less functionality, but might have slightly and an emphasis on slightly better performance. Right, but and you we're can do that in VB as well. Yeah. So it's sort of up to you whether you want to do it the more functional, slow, you know, slightly slower way or the less functional, faster way. Both are available to you. And we're talking about nanoseconds here, right? I mean, yeah, we're really... I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it... most of the time when you see this, you know, they got to stick it in a loop that runs a billion times, and right. then you can see the difference. Yeah, right. So, you know, I always, I always like to say that, you know, it's not going to make Form 2 come up any faster when you click the button. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. So. Yeah, it's most, mostly it's the kind of thing where you're never going to notice any differences at all. Yeah. And you know in the in the very exotic cases where maybe you are converting a billion numbers, you've got the option to change to use the sure. way that C# does it and 
you know, I mean, it's really not a C-sharp way. It's just right. sort of, there are two different ways of doing it a lot of times. So Yeah, but, but the answer is I would rather have the flexibility to do it quickly, you, you know, nanosecond be damned or whatever, you know. So exactly. So, you know, so we and and I would emphasize, too, that, you know, when we look at adding new features and this kind of addresses the future question as well, when we look at new features, performance is a major consideration. So, you know, we're not going to introduce new features that cause your apps to run slower and slower over time, because really nobody, you know, that's not really a very uh, big selling point if that actually happened. So right. it's, uh, you know, as we think about things in the future, we're really looking at, OK, how can we add this functionality to make it easier to write applications, but to give you really good performance as well? So does it just mean that – so is there any truth to what he says in that, you know, VB as a net, as a language, and as a development environment will gain more higher-level tools than C Sharp will? Well, like that's a, I don't know. <laughs> I could also see what Jay would have to say about that. But, you know, I know that for VB, we're thinking we're always thinking about – how to make it easier and simpler to write applications. I don't actually know much about what the C Sharp, you know, team is thinking about where they want to go with that. So right. it's uh, it's hard for me to characterize like a difference between the two. Okay. But I can say definitely for the VB side of it, we're looking, we're always looking at ways to make it even easier and quicker for all kinds of programmers to write their applications more quickly. And and again, I, I should the, emphasize... Carl, if I can jump in for a second. Sure. Um, one of the made the major features that we have coming in VB 2005, as you know, is my, which right. is kind of a speed dial into the framework. Right. So there's a lot of things where, like, let's say you want to read all the text out of a file. Yeah. That's three or four, maybe five lines of code to go in, open the file, open the stream, attach a right. um, stream reader to it, read the text, and then close the, the file in the reader. Yeah. Um, in my, that's one line of code. Right. So that's, the type of thing that we're implementing for the 2005 release, but one of the major design considerations in putting that in has always been that we write highly efficient, highly optimized code for the stuff within my. So that it's no slower or faster than it's the same speed as doing it the, the long way. Right. And if there are developers who want the additional control and don't want to do that, they're welcome to continue writing using the the file streams and um, stream readers and writers right. manually themselves. So it's almost like it's almost like there it's all good and there's no downside. I mean that you can always do things the C sharp way if you want, but you're also going to get these higher level tools that you know maybe a nanosecond here, a millisecond there, or whatever are going to slow you down. But you if you if speed like you say, if you're in a tight loop, you're doing things a million, two million, a billion times or whatever, you know, you're going to notice the speed difference. You can always drop down to to doing things the framework way, which the C-sharp programmer doesn't have the option to do it um, in a more high-level way. Right. Well, yeah. The, the C-sharp programmer um, can choose to import Microsoft.VisualBasic.DLL. Yeah. And they won't get the my keyword because that's specific to the language itself. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the other features that we've written that are a part of my mm -hmm. will be available to them. Oh, okay. But then they might get laughed out of the C Sharp Club. Right. <laughs> <laughs> for using something with Visual Basic in its name. So like ping, for example. That's something in my that's that's not in the framework. And that, that would be very useful to a C Sharp program, I would think. That would be the type of thing we're talking about, sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, guys, I can't thank you enough for stopping by and clearing that up for us. Oh, and, great. Uh, you know, we, we, like I say, we got some emails. Some people are a little concerned and, you know, they want to they wanna hear it from the horse's mouth. Sure. All right, guys. We'll definitely have you on the show uh, at uh, Whidbey launch time. And uh, I can't wait for that. We're looking forward to it, too. All right, definitely. guys. We'll see you later. All righty. Talk Thanks. to you later. Awesome. Okay, well, there you have it, right from the horse's mouth. So now it's time to, uh, we're running a little bit late, so I want to get right to uh, announcing Kimberly, uh, Kimberly Tripp. Kimberly is a SQL Server MVP and a Microsoft Regional Director and has worked with SQL Server ever since 1990. Since 1995, Kimberly has worked as a speaker, writer, trainer, and consultant for her own company, SY Solutions Incorporated. 
The URL is www.sequelskills.com, where she focuses on creating interesting and educational content around building scalable and available SQL Server-based systems. Focusing mostly on performance tuning and availability, Kimberly frequently writes for SQL Server Magazine, was a technical contributor for the SQL Server 2000 Resource Kit, and co-authored the Microsoft Press title, SQL Server 2000 High Availability. Kimberly has lectured for Microsoft TechEd, SQL Server Magazine Connections, PASS, PASS, and VS Live, and is consistently a top-rated speaker. Kimberly works closely with Microsoft to provide new and interesting technical resources, including the SQL Server 2000 High Availability Overview DVD, featuring more than nine hours of in-depth technical content, demos, and peer chats with MVPs. Currently, Kimberly is working to help create SQL Server 2005 content, including labs, white papers, MSDN webcasts, and more. Prior to starting SY Solutions and SQL Skills, Kimberly held positions at Microsoft, including subject matter expert trainer for Microsoft University and technical writer for the SQL Server development team. You can get more information on SQLSkills.com and on Kimberly's blog, www.sqlskills.com slash blog slash Kimberly. Won't you please welcome to the show Kimberly Tripp. How are you? I'm good, Carl. I really didn't think you were going to read that whole thing. Well, you know, I couldn't leave anything painful out painful for me. <laughs> it usually is, you know. Nobody wants to hear their... It's like seeing your life flash before your eyes. Oh, yeah, I did that. Oh, yeah, I did that, too. How are you? I am great, great. A little bit little bit nervous to be here only because I, I've heard you two before and, and you two uh, kind of scare me. <laughs> uh, like, you don't have to be afraid. We've eaten cake together. That's true. Oh, that's right. I can't remember if... Dev Connections, I think. Yeah, no, no, I remember... I remember well. I was wondering if you fed me or I fed you or <laughs> da-da, Bill da-da. Vaughn actually. I do believe fed you a bite of cake. I think yes. I think we were all talking. And somebody fed somebody else a bite of cake. That's all that I remember. But whatever happens, you know, we share a bond now. Um, yeah, that was formed <laughs> at that moment. So yeah, nothing to be afraid of. Yeah, well, speak for yourself, pal. <laughs> Plus, we're just a couple of posers. I mean, what is there to be afraid of? Really? I mean, you know. No, no, I just, uh, so, you know, being recorded is always a scary thing. You have to, to be careful. I, so I, I'd like to be involved in the edit process, please. <laughs> <laughs> It'll cost you. Uh-oh. I, I do remember hearing, uh, talking with Bill Vaughn on the show. We've talked to him many times, and he uh, has said on the show, I think, that he really enjoys listening to you talk, and he always learns a lot. So, um, and that's pretty good. I mean, he's a well-respected guy, as are you a well-respected guy, and uh, I'll just let that one slide. <laughs> and uh, it's okay. true. When you say you get consistently high scores, man, that is true. I've never seen sessions so packed as your sessions at TechEd, at Dev Connections, or SQL Connections. Uh, how do you do that? <laughs> I, You know, I really, I really don't know, except that I, I'm, I'm still really having a good time working with SQL and chatting with people about their problems. And for some reason, I haven't gotten sick of the problems that people are running into. And, and it's just, it's still interesting to me. I, I, I can't believe that I can learn something new every day. I mean, I, it just, it shocks me that I can sit down and do something that I've done for 14 years and, and each day find something that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And, uh, hmm. and, and so I, I guess I'm still excited about it. And people tell me that my enthusiasm is contagious and, I guess people kind of get energized, and and it is. It's exciting for me, and and I think that turns around and and makes people have fun. And for, I, th- that yeah. might be it. I don't know. Well, for example, I was le- I just found out just now that uh, from Richard, who I am to me, saying that you were the number one speaker at Tech Ed in Dallas in two thousand three. Wow, that's awesome. That was really that was really a, a fun event. Um, I the energy that week was great, and I had I had some great audiences, some great questions. I even I in fact I have to tell you that one of the funniest stories from that particular conference. Um, I was actually working on a white paper for for Beta One, so each night I was kind of going back and pulling just horrible nights till two o'clock, three o'clock in the morning, working on this partitioning white paper, mm-hmm. and um, I wasn't getting much sleep, so I was I was even more. I don't know what the word is, but um, I was even a little bit more out there than normal. But I, 
I just, there was a great energy, and this guy came up to me on one of my breaks in between two sessions that were running back to back. I had like a 15 minute break, and he said to me, I have my laptop, and I've been implementing the things you've been talking about while you've been talking about them, and I've already increased my performance by like tenfold or something like that. And, and I just, it was so fun. Wow. I was exhausted. I was having this kind of week from hell, basically, and and yet people were still just like coming up to me and saying, oh, this is so cool. I'm having so much fun. And I, you know, like I said, the energy was just great. And I had a great week and, and it, it, it did turn out to be, to be a lot of fun. And the, the numbers were good and I can't complain about that. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Well, congrats on that. That's, a, that's incredible. So I guess, you know, the things that you, people, uh, you, you're into performance tuning, you're into indexing big time. And, uh, you know, it always seems to me to be a black art, you know, when to index, how to index, because I never right. quite, <laughs> yeah. you know, I never quite figured it out like it. And, you know, so to, it's really, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about this. Uh, I just want to say these are some of my favorite shows, too, because I only have, uh, you know, like any developer, I'm sort of just kind of amateurish when it comes to SQL Server. I mean, I can get by and I can add in a box and stuff like that, but I always get something out of these because, like you said, Carl, it is sort of a black art, and I'm always sort of scratching my head, like, should I check that box or do I need to check right. these boxes over here? So I'm pumped. Yeah, I just want to. I just want to mention that. I'll just. I'll sit back now. Go ahead. Ask some questions. Do whatever you need to do. So here, let's start it off like this. You know, let's just cut right to the chase. What is the single biggest thing? tip that is the easiest to you know pass on that can dramatically improve the performance of a SQL server oh that's a great question I you know it it's it's funny I always make the joke that if there were a SQL server slash faster switch I right. would tell you you know and, right. and I wish I wish there were a magic bullet or or some you know always do this and and life will be good and and I think one of the reasons why I like SQL server so much is that there's often 10 different ways to do something. Yeah. And, and I know that's painful for a lot of people because they want, you know, the, the quick solution, the easy solution, the do this. And I, I realized that if SQL Server did have that, it would be a lot easier to get better performance more consistently. Right. So, so I wish I could say, you know, just do this. But, but there is one thing, and that is indexing, that by far is the easiest to implement with no application changes that can make, a huge, I, and I, I'm not just talking, you know, something that's, that's one minute will be 50 seconds, because that to me is, is not necessarily worthwhile. But I've taken queries that are five minutes and 19 seconds, um, queries that go against e extremely large data sets. They're doing 20, the one I'm thinking of specifically is 27 table join, 13 outer joins, and it's, it's doing scans where it shouldn't be. And like I said, it was taking five minutes and 19 seconds. Wow. And literally, this is the thing that's, that's really scary to me. I, I looked at it. I know a lot about the internals of processing joins. And I said, oh, it's doing a loop join. I need to put XYZ index in place. So I did. And I brought the query to two and a half minutes. Now, don't, don't be impressed. Even though that's cool, it's half the speed right. or at half the time, right? Twice as fast. It still, to me, seemed like there was something missing. So I, I created a different index, and I literally took that query from 5 minutes and 19 seconds to 2 seconds. Wow. And, I, I mean, there's hmm. nothing in SQL. People always say, you know, kill it with iron. You know, that's kind of the common joke. Right, is, yeah, is throw, throw hardware, more at, hardware it. at it. Right, and, mm -hmm. and while throwing hardware at it can certainly be a good solution, the problem with it is that it'll take a query that's, that's doing 5 minutes and 19 seconds and doing an obscene number of IOs because that's what this query was doing. It was doing table scans of 24 million row tables and not just one of them, by the way. So it was doing these large scans. The appropriate indexes didn't exist. Okay, throw more disks at it. Throw more memory at it. You'll take a 5-minute and 19-second query down to 5 minutes and 4 seconds. Kim, it, seem, it seems... Yes. Like, what? You know what I mean? Like, who cares? Oh, no, I just it? I was just thinking about that kind of performance, you oh, know? Yeah, well... Five, five minutes, 19 seconds out of five minutes and four seconds, you know? Yeah, awesome. it's like, it's cool, but not enough. But right. with an index... <laughs> right. Yeah, but but with an index, it's so cool that, that you can end up using the resources you have a lot more efficiently, and you can take queries that are doing literally millions of IOs down to tens of thousands, if not thousands, if not hundreds, if not a couple... Can, and it, it is it is really amazing. Let so, me ask you a question because it seems to me as you're saying, 
you know, putting the appropriate indexes for the kind of thing that you're doing is key. Wouldn't it, it seems to me like there's an opportunity for somebody to make a tool that looks at your tables, looks at your start procedures, figures out what you're doing, and then applies the appropriate freaking indexes. Well, no. Okay, so that's, that's a great question. And Microsoft has a tool that does, you know, exactly that. Index Tuning Wizard in SQL 2000 okay. will actually allow you to, and there's two ways to run it. You can actually take a query directly from Query Analyzer, highlight the query, and hit Control-I. I'm kind of a keyboard geek. But you hit Control I, or you go to I forget which drop down, like Query Index Tuning Wizard, and you can you can ask it to tune the query. I it's a great tool, it's free, but the the problem with it is that it's it's not perfect. I mean, hell, yeah. if the pro, you know the product shipped perfect out of the box, we'd all be out of a job, right? right. So I I I love it. I use it, and I I I use it appropriately per se. Yeah. There's. I, in fact, I did an MSDN webcast. You know, Rory, I'm with you on this, going to MSDN, doing kind of the, the chats and so forth. I love MSDN. Um, but uh, on June 11th, I did an MSDN chat where I basically spoke about ITW and how to use it effectively. And there's a couple of things you can do in terms of the settings for ITW to basically get it to give you, in my opinion, better recommendations. Now, it's not... It's not going to solve all your problems. In fact, the exact query I was just describing, that 27 table, uh, 13 outer join, took 5 minutes and 19 seconds. We ran that through ITW, and it came back and said no index selection, you know, no index oh. choice recommendations. So it is, it is difficult to, to figure out by looking at, it's not some, it's, there's no magic there, in other well, words. Well, okay, so, so there is a little bit of magic, I, I will have to admit. But, but you brought up a good point, and I want to, I want to add on to something you said, which is, you know, tuning a query, because you said, oh, if you can tune a query and then you can get better performance, why can't there be a tool that does this? Right. Because you don't want to tune every query to the nth degree, right? Like if you sit down and you take each query, you know, put it in a box and you say, what do you need? You will have way too many indexes. And in fact, you'll end up negatively impacting your performance. So that's, that's where indexing becomes this, this art rather than a science. It's, it's how do you, and I, I kind of use this term a lot, how do you find the right balance of having the right number of indexes for better performance while not having so many indexes that you actually burden your system in terms of maintenance, in terms of insert, update, delete performance? Right. So y there is kind of an art to it, and, and there's kind of a series of steps that I recommend. Kind of start here, do this, try this, then use ITW, then do these other things, right? Yeah. So. I mean, I don't want to talk for like 40 minutes here on this one thing, but, um, you know, I'd be happy to tell you. What <laughs> I guess I, what I'm, I'm gaining a more uh, mature appreciation of, you know, the, the complexity of these systems that, that a, you know, a wizard can't just look at, you know, oh, they're doing this there and they're therefore apply this index on that. I mean, it's just, it's beyond the scope of code generation. Well, okay, so now that's a great point, because I, I said ITW through Query Analyzer tuning a query to the nth degree, yeah. but you can use Profiler right. to capture a workload, get a whole variety of the different types of queries that have run on your system, and then run the entire workload through ITW. Yeah. And that, again, isn't perfect either, but it can still give you suggestions that you may not have thought about, and it's better than hmm. not doing it. Hmm. And, and Good point. It's it's easy, it's free, and it's a step that's worthwhile. And I, I guess, you know, if you're really interested, because I do go through each of the steps and how to use the tools more effectively in the webcast. Okay. And there's actually a webcast that I link to that is a two-hour webcast on Profiler. So if you've never used Profiler, you can watch that webcast on MSDN, then watch my webcast, which is basically how to tie Profiler Index Tuning Wizard together and some best practices. Oh, that's cool. So they've got like four hours of homework. <laughs> yeah. Do you have in your book, in your SQL 2000 book, do you go over like the thought process of when to apply what index and, and, and how and why and clustered or not and all those kinds of decisions? Oh, this is so funny that you, you asked me this. You, you've got me. Um, all right. The book is actually not on performance tuning. And oh, this oh is okay. <laughs> this is what's so ironic. Okay. I, people, in fact, this, this was funny. I was in Japan a couple of years ago and... Um, I was getting interviewed about the two lectures I was giving, and I gave one lecture on high availability and the other lecture on performance tuning. Okay. And I remember them saying to me, these topics seem so diverse, 
how can you feel like you're an expert in the two, right? And and it was a great question. And I, I really had to think about it for a second. But since then, I've I've really decided that they're all related to availability. I mean, if you think about it, okay, your server's not up and running. Um, that's one thing, right? Your server's down. Certainly certain high availability technologies, clustering, log shipping, can help you switch to a secondary either automatically or manually. But if your server can't, perform like if if you go click on some dialogue and you try to do something and it's taking 5 minutes to actually process then you're going to lose customers they're going to go to another site they're yeah. not going to wait 5 minutes to buy a book right right so my point there is that your server might be up and running but it is perceived unavailability because they can't get squat sure. done right sure so so i guess I've, I've basically said I like to focus on availability, and, and that book specifically was all about high availability and technologies, and, and I wrote the chapters on the environment settings and backup restore and all the different kind of ins and outs of disaster recovery with backups. So cool. I didn't do any performance stuff in that book. Okay, but it's all in webcasts, I guess, is what you're trying to say. Yeah, I've got some stuff in webcasts, and um, you might see something in the Yukon time frame on indexes from me, and that's all I'm going to say. No commitment. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll definitely put up the links to the webcasts on the Oh, right on. on. Yeah, I'll page. give you all those links. Absolutely cool. Well, let's. Uh, I think uh, that's the kind of thing that I want to talk about, though, is uh, you know your your tips for indexing and performance tuning. You know what? When when do I cluster an index, for example? Oh, okay. So this became such a great discussion, um, conference after conference. In fact, there was an MVP who I, who I just adore, and I'm not going to name him, because, uh, although I don't think he would mind. But <laughs> the first time I gave a lecture, this was maybe two or three years ago, that he saw, he came up to me and said, I totally disagree with you. That's not what I would do, blah, blah, blah. It was, it was quite funny, but, but very um, you know, professional. It wasn't rude or anything like that. Right. And then... Um, he happened to be in another lecture of mine like a year later, and I was giving a similar talk, and I, I mentioned something that I remembered him saying that he didn't agree with, he hated it, and I remember standing up on stage and saying, well, this is what I would do even though Jeff doesn't, th oh, so, well, anyway, Jeff, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, even though Jeff wouldn't do this, and um, he came up to me later and he goes, no, I agree with you now. <laughs> So it, it it's funny. I, I have this thing that I tend to call the clustered index debate. Okay. And it, it's kind of what are the key criteria that you should look at when you're defining how to cluster your tables and should you even have a clustered index on your tables? Sure. Um, and and there isn't a single right answer that's that's right all the time. But, you know, I would probably guess that 99% of your listeners are not running a system that has to achieve thousands of transactions a second. Okay, hundreds, yes, maybe maybe thousands overall, multiple systems and so forth, but I don't think that the norm is, let's say, 700 inserts a second for one table across many tables in one database, right? I mean, that's kind of the very, very top yeah. tier. So if I start talking about 99% of the population out there with medium to large, high volume throughput databases, don't get me wrong, but not the, the absolute, uh, you know, top end, there is a pretty standard process that I tend to follow. But the reasons actually are, are not just performance, but they're also maintenance and backup related even. Um, mm. it, it, so when you cluster a table, just to take a step back, you're going from a heap structure to a clustered table. A heap structure is a table that is unordered, and to be real honest, SQL Server optimizes heaps for space utilization, not performance. So what that okay. means is that as you do deletes, they'll insert into the space that was freed by the deletes, right? So the table is kind of self-containing, if that makes sense. It yeah. kind of it stays its size, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so a heap structure is kind of optimized for space. But think about that for a second. If they're going to insert where they did a delete, they have to know where that free space is. So finding the place to do the insert can actually cost you in terms of performance. And that's why you have an index in the first place. Well, and, and when you cluster a table, you, you put order to the table as opposed to it being, you know, out of order and random per se, you have an order that, of course, defines the location for insert. 
And depending on what you've done with that table's order, you may actually help speed up the time that it takes to do an insert. So I, I, I tend to say there's really three types of tables. Okay. There's tables that have a bad clustered index, tables that are heaps, and tables that have a good clustered index. Hmm. Because a bad clustered index is one where inserts have to go into, like imagine the phone book. Imagine keeping the phone book up to date you know, every second of the day as new people come and go. Now, I, there's not that many people moving in and out of any region that would be that high volume, but you know, you insert a new Jones and you'd have to, to make room and shift everything down. Well, that's not what SQL Server does, but the, the putting that record into the appropriate place causes something called a split, which causes fragmentation or which is fragmentation. Mm-hmm. And that costs you in terms of the insert and then later in terms of maintenance. So that's a bad clustered index choice because it's going to create a lot of gap. Are you getting all, are you getting all this, Rory? So, <laughs> That, that's one um, of the negatives. I, uh, yeah, just keep it going. <laughs> She's blowing my mind. I don't know about you. I'm from the Midwest. We talked. <laughs> well, no, actually, no. There. Some th- there are there. No, there are a lot of things here that are they're making a lot of sense to me. And I'm what I'm doing while you talk, Kimberly, is I'm thinking back to times that I've been in uh, in Enterprise Manager and done a bit of right clicking and opened up some property dialogues and checked things without really knowing what they were doing. And yeah. I'm thinking back and realizing that I have, you know, been quite guilty of having put together quite a few bad index tables. And so I'm sort of silently and figuratively spanking myself over here while you talk. <laughs> but please continue. And don't let the thought of me spanking myself make you uncomfortable. So go yeah, ahead. This could bring us on a whole new level here. I'm going to just avoid that one. <laughs> good, that's good, Cam. I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> so... Oh, Rory, ask about good versus identity. I'm watching you guys, too, just so you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, okay, so it, it, so let me just finish up this bad clustered sure. index, good clustered index, and then I'll do good versus identities, because that's a great debate, actually. But um, So a bad clustered index is one where the ordering to the data creates a, a pattern that when data is coming in, it needs to kind of make room for new data. So something like last name is a bad idea. If you can have an index where the data is ever increasing, like a great example, you have an employee table, you have an employee ID, that employee ID is an identity column that's an ever increasing or ever decreasing is fine as well, just as long as it moves one direction left or right. Then all your inserts go to the end. And, you know, people are almost immediately going to say, doesn't that create a hotspot? And hotspots used to be this thing that we, we freaked out about prior to 7.0 because in 6.5 we had page level locking. And if we had one person trying to party on a page, everybody else would wait. So you'd have this horrible blocking scenario. Right. Now that we have two row level lock, you know what I mean? Sure. Right? So, so you'd have like this one person inserting, everybody would wait and you'd turn your multi-user relational database into like this single user. Yeah, I've been, I've been there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think we all have actually. I'm I'm surprised I stuck around with SQL Server after 1.0. You know, speaking speaking of which, 1.0 was a single thread, a single process, single thread. You got to start <laughs> people, somewhere. People round robin. They got a time slice. It was, it was probably great. probably written in Quick Basic. Yeah. It, well, it was OS2. It was OS2. You got 16 mega RAM. That's when I started working Woo-hoo! with it. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> but um. So, so do the okay. version numbers correspond to the number of threads? No, no, but uh, <laughs> but that would be funny because uh, no, I'm not even going to go there. But no, <laughs> so okay, and and see, this is this is my problem. Is once you get me started, you really can't <laughs> shut me up, right? <laughs> All right. So if everybody's inserting to the same page, but you have row level locking, the thing that that's really cool about this, the, think about this for a second, right? The page that you're inserting into, the page that you need, is going to be in memory already, yeah. right? So you're going to end up needing less pages and the pages you need are already going to be there. So you're actually going to get better insert performance and you're not going to need to make room. You're just going to need to link in new pages. And what ends up happening is your, your inserts will keep your table more compact and you'll be able to get better throughput for your inserts and you'll then reduce fragmentation and then reduce the maintenance costs on those tables as well. And your backups will be more compressed because you're not wasting so much free space because of these things called splits. So it, there are huge benefits to kind of having the right clustered index. But you know how I said up to a point, like when you get to 
a huge number of inserts a second, right. they get into trouble linking in those new pages. So in a, a really high volume system, I wouldn't go random. I would try to either partition into multiple tables or create, let's say, two, three, or four hotspots in one table so that you create, let's say, region identity so that you get a pattern of increasing by Washington, a pattern of increasing by California, a pattern of increasing by Oregon, let's say. So then you can get three times the number ever increasing and still get really good throughput. Check. Are you guys still there? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> My head hurts. I, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out if I should check the box. I mean, <laughs> it's uh, it's very complex. So I, I think I hear what you're saying. Um, let me try to repeat it. So basically, if you're doing a large number of inserts in the table, you want to index uh, an identity, uh, an identity, put an index on an identity column clustered up to a point and after a certain number of a uh, certain amount of um, inserts per second if you want to say or per time unit uh, that's going to that's going to hurt performance is that what you're saying uh, definitely um, inserting to the end of the table up to a point is is great but when you get to the really really high end it can actually become uh, a hindrance in terms of having to link in these new pages and that part right. of the table does become so hot. Yes. So so is the key that do you remove the cluster at that point? Um, do you re-index it? What do you do? You can create a different clustered index that has multiple hotspots. Oh, 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 okay. Right, I something that, that, that has like a combination key of, of like state identity, something like that. Okay. Wow. Wait. Carl, at that point, you call Kim. No, okay, so there was actually a question that I noticed. Uh, can I, I – there's two. There's two. I'm sorry. I'm trying to no, look no, at this, this is and listen, and I'm really – I can only multitask so much. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. The, the one GUID versus identity, I do want to take that one because yeah. I've got into um, uh, quite a few discussions with people on this recently. I identities uh, for clustering keys are generally great because they create that ever-increasing pattern. GUIDs are fine for the primary key, but the confusion comes in because the default index type for a primary key is a clustered index. Right. So if you create a primary key on a GUID, then the GUID will automatically be your clustering key. And GUIDs, if you use the SQL Server new ID function to populate GUIDs, are not ever increasing or decreasing. They create kind of a ran random pattern, which then creates a lot of fragmentation and a lot of splitting. So if you want to use GUIDs as a primary key, that's fine. Make that a non-clustered index and consider clustering on an identity column so that you still get that ever-increasing pattern to the base structure, but then you can still do fast lookups for the primary key. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> that's not convincing, Crickets. Carl. Crickets. <laughs> <laughs> We'll play the crickets. I actually, th no, that, that made sense to me. That actually did make sense to me. And I had, I had wondered about that quite a bit because I'm one of those people who kind of alternated between using GUIDs and not. So I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I'm listening. Like I'm staring out my window. I'm not even blinking and I'm hanging on every single word here. So, I mean, this is good stuff. Yeah. Wow, I, have, sense. I have very good power over you, don't I? I'm <laughs> definitely going to have to go back and listen to the show to get a lot of that because, you know, there's like screens popping up and laptops or, are rebooting on me all of a sudden, and I have no idea why. And uh, in some <laughs> like this, Phil B in the uh, chat room says, "I'm going back to Jet. <laughs> He's had enough. <laughs> oh, you know, God, this is no, too complicated." Please, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't. <laughs> Uh, okay, so yeah. somebody says identity good, good, bad. Goods aren't bad for distributed applications or for, for keys where you want to have something that's not predictable. And, right. and I, I am okay with them as a key, but I would not use them as a clustered index. So. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Yeah. Key, key good, index good, clustered index bad. Yeah, and there's another good question here. Um, we have lots of databases where users need to search for a substring in a field. The like clause doesn't perform well, so I started using full text indexes. On large databases, 15 million plus rows, it's still pretty slow. Are there any design choices I could use? Well, okay, so 
Full text indexing in and of itself is not an area of expertise for me, so I, I wouldn't even begin to try to, to tell you how to optimize full text indexing. But I have taken some scenarios prior to full text indexing and, and even since full text indexing that can be kind of interesting, and that's kind of creating categories for different types of rows and then doing lookups on your categories and using regular SQL indexes on the categories. In, instead of searching for every random word per se within the text. But if you need to, to search for anything within the text field, then you need really full text indexing. And then you should look into how to optimize full text indexes. And there's, there's quite a few, I think, webcasts and resources out there on optimizing full text. I, I just wouldn't be the best person for that one. Yeah, okay. And there was another one. Um, let's see. Yeah, these, this is great that Kim's plugged into the chat room. I didn't even have to ask any questions. The fans are, the teeming millions here are asking great questions. So, We've actually got quite a few. The chat room's uh, clogged tonight. Yeah, it's really People, clogged, the, yeah. There was a report from Don XML that, um, that it was refusing any more connections. So, Wow. Um, what do you feel, somebody's asking about MSDE. So is that like the middle ground then? Yeah, MSDE is, well, it's, it's kind of the precursor to the SQL Server Express edition that's just been released. Right. Um, and MSDE is kind of the... the it's and rehab this, for access programmers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's meant to be the, the you know, developer environment. Um, it's, it's scaled down. I think the maximum database size is 2 gig. Um, and, uh, you know, it has limited connections, that kind of thing. And it's more for development environments. But it, it also is something that can be shipped and deployed as long as, you know, your customer databases are going to stay relatively small. Yeah. And, you know, quite honestly, MSD, it's weird. SQL Server scales up, scales down. There's seven different editions of SQL Server. Hmm. SQL Server runs on WinCE. I have, I have good friends in WinCE, but I have never actually run SQL Server on a WinCE. Um, but all of the things that you do for SQL Server kind of in the enterprise, you can do on the MSDE environment. The only negative is that there really aren't the same tools for the MSDE environment um, unless you manage the MSDE environment from a, a real SQL Server environment. So that's kind of the negative. Um, so it doesn't really come fully loaded with all the tools. So that's probably the biggest negative. Now, SQL Express, on the other hand, and again, I won't claim to be an expert in any way, um, but SQL Express, on the other hand, is coming with management tools, and it's even coming with um, kind of a scaled down, I think, web-based UI. And I, I can't remember what all the rules are on that. But SQL Express is also going to be free. And you got to like that. Yeah, you got to totally like free. free. So, no strings attached like yeah, MSDE no MSD has. Well, Kim, this has been fascinating so far, and I'm looking forward to some more in the second half. But right now it's time to uh, take a break and pay the bills and listen to some music. So if you like to sit back and relax and enjoy... We'll be right back. Hi, Daddy.
Hey, if you've got a VBNet team or a, even a VB6 team that needs just to get up to speed on VBNet without fooling around, maybe you guys have read some books, maybe you've been to a couple of uh, one-day training classes and you, you have the tools, but you don't really know what to do. Well, you should be coming to my classes, ASP.NET Masterclass for ASP-centric development in VBNet and the VBNet Masterclass for Windows Forms, components, data, and everything else. And, uh, you know, this has been a successful class ever since Beta 1. We've had many success stories where our customers have gone on to be productive right away. The typical project cycle for the kinds of uh, companies that have taken my class and gone on tends to be about five or six months before they ship their product after taking my class. So go to www.franklins.net if you've got a team of developers you'd like to uh, train and just stop messing around do things right learn it the right way tried and true patterns and practices best practices the right thing to do i'll tell you all about it but unfortunately i can't tell you here you got to come to class and it's a great area and it's a great environment look we're two hours from boston we're two and a half hours from new york we're an hour from new haven we're an hour from hartford we're an hour from providence And we have Long Island to the south, and you can just hop on a ferry, or you could take a train. A train pulls up right in New London. You could walk right to the Radisson. It's two blocks. You could walk from the Radisson another block over to the training room. You don't even have to rent a car. If you want to rent a car, if you want to fly in, the best airport is TF Green Airport in Providence or Warwick, Rhode Island. But uh, it's actually PVD is the airport code. And you fly in, you grab a car, 45 minutes later, you're in New London, you're at the Radisson, soaking in the hot tub, and talk about food, man, we, we, we take you to lunch every day, and there's nothing better than getting a small group of programmers who don't know each other, but they share a common, you know, interest, out in a good restaurant, you know, have a margarita, whatever, have some great uh, Mex- authentic Mexican food, or some ribs, or some New York style pizza or uh, some Thai food or some Indian food, some Japanese food, whatever it is. We have everything here in London. So go to www.franklins.net, click on the classes, the VBNet Masterclass, ASPNet Masterclass. You'll be glad you did. I know you will. And just a couple other announcements here. The, uh, the tablet PC contest is in full swing. That's right. You could win yourself a Toshiba M200 tablet PC. Just by going to www.franklins.net slash .net rocks and click right there on the link at the top where the tablet PC is and you can enter the contest. All we're, we're, what we're trying to do is learn a little bit more about you and what languages you like and what technologies you're interested in, how many developers there are at your office and just a couple of questions like that and uh, you're eligible to win. We're going to have a drawing on the show August 26th, although you don't have to be listening live to win. And this is a honking machine. It's a Toshiba M200 Portage tablet convertible. It's got a 1.8 gig processor. It's got a gig of RAM, 60 gig, 7200 RPM hard disk, built in uh, 802.11b. And uh, what more can you want? I mean, it's just incredible. We've got people using it as their main development machine now, finally. And it's just a you know 1400 by 1050 display. It's just unbelievable. So check that out, and good luck. I hope you win. Just want to give another shout-out to our friends at Data Dynamics, www.datadynamics.com. If you're looking for some programs that have been written in .NET, look no further than Active Reports for .NET. It's written completely in Managed C Sharp. It's not just a port of their Active Reports for ActiveX. ActiveReports.net, written in C Sharp, of course, integrates right into the Visual Studio Net IDE. And uh, it's based on a per-developer licensing scheme, royalty-free to distribute, comes with a report wizard and a Microsoft Access Report Conversion Wizard, so you can start creating reports quickly. Active Reports for .NET also has the ability to export to Adobe PDF, Microsoft Excel, RTF, HTML, text, and TIFF formats. It can also be used in both Windows and web applications. This is great. Standard edition is just $499. And I swear by it, a lot of the regional directors and MVPs that I know also use it. They have lots of happy customers constantly in my classes when I ask who's using what for reporting, uh, for simple reporting. The, you know, ActiveReports.net always tops the list. 
I guess you would call this like embedded reports. The reports are embedded in the application. Not like a, a reporting server like Crystal Enterprise or Microsoft Reporting Services. That's a totally different thing. That's not what ActorReports.net is all about. ActorReports.net is, here's a report, I'm defining it, it's associated with my application, it's included in the assembly, and it just works. www.datadynamics.com Coming up on the show next week, Miguel de Acaza is going to be talking about mono. Uh, coming up the week after that, we don't know who, but after that, we have Charles Petzold. And after Charles, we'll, of course, Charles Petzold, the, one of the founding fathers of Windows API books and programming. After that, we have uh, Programming with Least Privilege with Don Kiley. Uh, the next week, we have Dave Wecker, a brilliant guy who cut his teeth at DEC on... Uh, uh, recognition systems on speech recognition and things like that. He's just an incredible guy from Microsoft with a big history, and he's a total, total, total geek head. And uh, we are just going to have a great time talking to Dave. So some great people coming up here on the show, and we hope you will stick around uh, and listen to those shows. So, uh, Rory, how you doing? Carl, doing all right. How's your head feel? How does my head feel? Yeah, mine's a little hurt. Are you talking about bit. the uh, the 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 Borg headgear attachment? No, no, no. I'm actually talking about the the conversation we're having with Kimberly. Just uh, <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm actually I, I, I'm digging it. Like I said, I yeah, love the too. database shows because that's one area where I still have a lot to learn. You know. Yeah. So I usually I dig this stuff. I'm just trying to. Li- I'm I'm actually listening a little slower than she's talking. She's just just really intense about it. And uh, no, that's okay. That's okay. And we didn't mean to talk about you while you were here, you know, in front of you. But we're going to anyway. Well, anyway, now's the time in our show when we do a little spot we like to call the Google Weirdos. Weirdos, 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 weirdos. If you want to know what Google Weirdos are, go to www.franklins.net slash .net rocks and look for the Google Weirdos link and it'll tell you all about it. We're not going to explain it anymore. Thank you very much. And the Google Weirdos, right? All right, so I don't have a whole lot of weirdos this week. I've got I've got some weirdos, and I've got mostly shouts outs. Um, with the first one being Rory Blythe. If it's okay, can you mention my blog mkenyon2.blogspot.com? And that is, of course, the blog of Mark Kenyon, who is a longtime listener, and he's been a really nice guy. So that's yep. mkenyon k e n y o n numeral two dot blogspot dot com. So yeah, shouts outs to Mark Kenyon. Now the next one is one of these uh, marathon. Shouts outs where somebody just wanted to see how long he could make it. So it's Rory Blythe. Just want to see how many characters I could fit in here as I was just listening to .NET Rocks and Google Weirdos. I know I probably have better things to do, but hey, here's a shout out to you and Carl. I think these are the last <laughs> few characters I can type before Google stops me from typing more. Maybe not. I guess I can type more. <laughs> and then it just gets cut off. So he, well, did, he, did, he did the best he could. <laughs> Next one it. is Rory Blythe versus Bacteria. Bacteria is winning. <laughs> but uh, the bacteria is not winning. I'm not having any bacterial problems right now. You know, it's all just good old fashioned uh, imbalanced brain chemistry. Next one is Rory Blythe. Shouts outs to Rory and his pimp unicycle. For anybody who'd forgotten about the unicycle and the monocle. And uh, I got to be careful here. The dog's starting to get kind of crazy in my lap. He's biting things and going nuts, which leads us nicely into the next Google weirdo. Um, or actually, the next shouts outs. It says, I can't believe you spent the day in a dog pee shirt, Rory. Was this after you humped your arm, too? <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. And sadly, the dog has begun a serious arm humping habit. But uh, we're going we're gonna to take him in for laser surgery, and we're going to take care of that pretty quickly. <laughs> next one is, Rory Blythe, I was reading your blog and could not find out why you were moving to Connecticut. Anyway, I just found .NET Rocks a few weeks ago, and I really love the show. Tell Carl hi later. John in New Orleans. So that was just sort of a traditional kind wow. of uh, kind of shouts outs. Yeah. And so I only I only found three entries that I would really consider to be Google weirdos. I know that's just mm. very few, but you know I'm I'm going for quality here more than I'm going for quantity. <laughs> and the first one is oh wait no this is the shouts outs too. It's my cell phone loves you Rory and I, I don't know what that phone. means. I don't know what is 
Yeah, self phone, S E L F. I don't know what a self phone is. <laughs> I know what a cell phone is, but I don't know what a cell phone is, and I don't know why it loves me. So now we move to the two Google weirdos. The first one is Rituals with Chicken Heads, and that's sort of, uh, yeah, I don't really know what that is. I mean, just go get Rituals for Chicken Heads for Dummies or whatever, or something like that. I don't, I don't know where you get information on that sort of thing. <laughs> and then the last one, and I actually really like this one. I think this one is really cool because it paints a picture in my mind of somebody somewhere who is in a really embarrassing, really bad situation, probably with this animal in his or her bathtub and the <laughs> search is health juices or cheap medicine for ill octopus because <laughs> when i was a kid we'd sometimes bring injured birds inside and nurse them back to health and then send them on their way or if we found a little mouse that was kind of cute that had a little broken toe or something we'd help him out and feed him some cheese and then send him out into the wilderness but this is somebody who found like an octopus that was limping along under the water and took it out and took it home and decided they were gonna nurse it back to health and they realized we don't know anything about octopi so they got to figure out where to buy octopus food and where they're gonna get yeah octopus band-aids and octopus you know purina octopus chow yeah, so what do you do? Yeah, screw well, it. Anyway. So that's it. That's the Google Weirdos for the week. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Even though they were few, they weirdos, were weirdos, wonderful. Weirdos, weirdos. 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 Very, very, very funny. And, uh, you know, speaking of funny and, and Rory and how funny Rory is, we were, we're putting together .NET Rocks the movie, as you know here, uh, Rory, which is sort of a combination of um, uh, footage of an actual show that we did where we had cameras on each other and then we edited it together to make it look like like a real TV show or something. And also footage from TechEd where we were just walking around talking to people and goofing around and having fun. And uh, so that is in the works. But anyway, we were showing, I was showing it to uh, Rich Pendleton here who runs Interbridge Technologies, uh, the ISP that keeps us keeps us all going at uh, .NET Rocks and Franklin's Net. And he came to this critical point where you did something to the camera, and I won't, <laughs> I won't give it away what it was. And it wasn't anything dirty or anything terrible. But the look on your face, man, you were so funny that he pissed himself laughing. <laughs> I don't know if he'd probably really appreciate you telling everybody about him urinating in his pants while oh, laughing. Oh, no, no, he's proud of it. <laughs> yeah, he was, awesome. he was yeah and the second and third time it was just as funny he couldn't breathe he was literally out of breath it's so funny hmm. well anyway i know everybody's looking forward to that we are still working on it now let's get back to kim kim you still with us i am after all that silliness we apologize for that no no <laughs> that that i i love it <laughs> I, I'm very concerned about that poor octopus, though. Well, yeah, I'm more concerned about its owners. Jeez. Yeah, really. They stop the, they should stop them from contributing to the gene pool. That's for sure. Well, I'm thinking what they'll probably do is kind of like in uh, Train Spotting when the guy ODs on heroin, so they just dump him off in front of the hospital. Maybe they'll just dump the octopus off in front of the veterinarian's <laughs> hospital or something like that, which is sort of tragic, but it's also kind of comical at the same time. Maybe it isn't. I shouldn't be saying that on the air. <laughs> I didn't say anything. <laughs> Well, well, uh, well, I have to tell you that I have a saltwater fish tank. So, see, I'm I'm very that's hardcore. Yeah, that is that because those aren't easy to clean and no, to keep. they're a, they're quite a bit of work. Yeah, a bit of work. And with my schedule traveling, it's it's very hard to uh, keep up. Now, your schedule you you're doing a lot of not just conferences and things, but you're you're actually putting together something of your own, aren't you? You and uh, a few other people. Tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well. I've been doing internal training at Microsoft for, for nine years, and I, I work with Microsoft. I'm two miles down the road from main campus, which uh, is scary, I realize. They're, they're one of my primary customers. I do a lot of white papers, conferences, and I, I've been doing internal training for MSTE, Microsoft Technical Education, for about nine years. And I've only been doing sessions and one-day workshops at conferences, and something I came up with is kind of having this idea of a boot camp you know, four days of really intense lecture, demo, self-paced exercises, extend the days beyond the nine to five hours and from five to seven, allow people to do 
to exercise, bring their laptops, bring their problems. We can troubleshoot, kind of figure out what's going on in, in you know, your specific environments. And basically, you know, have a beer. I figured at around 6 o'clock I can have the, the hotel kind of maybe bring in some refreshments. We can hang out, you know, long Great. days. Absolutely. And, and yeah, it's it's really cool. So I'm doing four days of that in October, and then the fifth day, Bill Vaughn is joining me and doing a, a lecture on data access best practices, um, data architectures, ADO.net. So basically, it's four days of server side. Almost two days of that are on indexes, by the way, index creation, index internals, index maintenance. But then I'm also doing optimizing procedural code, locking and blocking, uh, partitioning. I've decided to throw in five or six um, pretty relevant, important topics on Yukon so that people can at least be aware of them. So it's it's basically one of these kind of boot camp style events where you just immerse yourself into the technology for a week. And, and so I call them immersion events. So how does one participate? How do we sign up? And uh, everything is on SQL skills. Yeah, www.sqlskills.com. Okay. Okay. And um, on SQL skills, you can basically look in the left pane and find SQL immersion events. And I have the details. Um, got a great rate at a hotel downtown Chicago. Um, you know, so you can walk to everything. Um, it's it's just it's going to be a blast. And it's I think I've still got uh, the the early bird discount until August first. Um, but you know, hey, if if somebody on the the show wants to sign up and and they can't get things approved within a few days, just shoot me off an email. Say you heard it on .NET Rocks, and I'll make sure to give you the the early bird discount. Oh, that's great. Yeah, Excellent. yeah. See oh, what yeah, you get for listening, people. What's that? I said, see what you get for listening, people. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. And it's going to be small. You know, my my goal is is you know keep it relatively small. Um, you know, and I, I'm just wondering how many people I'll even even yeah. get. I've got a good number so far, so I, I'm actually quite quite happy. But I'm going to cut off the registrations. I, I'm thinking at at thirty, forty people. Yeah, and, that's uh, that's, that's a challenge. And keep it nice and and uh, and fun. So. Well, that's great. Good luck. Thanks. And Thanks. Uh, yeah, let us know how it, how it worked out. I want to. Um, bring up a, a topic that's near and dear to your heart and that uh, that has been discussed in our circles before anyway, but we've never talked about it on the show for, for uh, whatever reason. Um, actually, we have, but we, we never have had your point of view, and uh, I'm interested in this. A while ago, some uh, somebody, one of the RDs, and well, Rocky Latka, did this uh, test with store procedures versus dynamic SQL. And he found out that in this application that he had written, it was actually faster with dynamic SQL than with stored sure. procedures. Sure. And we got into this thing on the RD list about, you know, when do you store procs, when not. You know, all of a sudden, the conventional wisdom, which is always use stored procedures, was sort of turned on its head. Right. And, uh, and, uh, and I remember many emails flying back and forth. It was probably about a year ago, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And many emails flying back and forth, and yours finally settled it. So tell us, tell us what happens. Okay, well, so again, it's kind of this, is there a right answer that is always the best thing to do? And I, I do think that stored procedures are fantastic. Um, a lot of people say stored procedures are fantastic because they perform better because they're pre-compiled. And that's the part that I disagree with. I think stored procedures are great for consistency, for security purposes, for reuse of code, you know, the right. whole benefits of central, uh, centralized logic that you can call from many applications. You can change it once. As long as the behavior doesn't, ex- you know, change to the client, you, you can change things a lot more easily. I, those are some of the reasons I love stored procedures. But when somebody says, I use stored procedures because they're always fast, because they're pre-compiled, that's where I would disagree because the whole pre-compilation notion is not always a good thing. A yeah. stored procedure, yeah, and this is this is where that whole thing started from. Right. Somebody had somebody had blogged about saying stored procedures are evil. You should never use stored. That's procedures. right. Yeah. Yeah, and then and and I I I'm sure I could find the blog entry now, but that's not the point. I my point was they're not always great and they're not always bad. I do think that they're always great, but it's if you know how to use them, and and 
what you can do when you create a stored procedure is you can kind of get some insight into whether or not that stored procedure's plan for different parameters, because different parameters can often uh, change the behavior of the stored procedure, obviously. That's kind of a well, duh, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You have different parameters. They change the behavior of the stored procedure. Well, if the stored procedure's plan, its optimization plan, was chosen on the first set of parameters, then the question becomes, is that plan good for all of the subsequent executions? Right. And, and if, if somebody executes a stored procedure and it only returns one row, that might be easily accessed through an index. But if somebody executes that stored procedure and it has a wild card, then, and especially if it has a leading wild card, then very likely indexes are not useful. And forcing it to use the index, which is what the, the pre-compiled plan does, it says, no, use this index, will hmm. actually make it run extremely inefficiently. Hmm. So, so when it all comes down to it, you need to look at the stored procedures plan, find out uh, a range or find a range of different um, options, you know, one row, 10 rows, 100 rows, 1,000 rows, if, if the stored procedures plan varies, see what the optimal plans are, and if the plans are different, then you can actually choose one of a couple of different ways to have that particular procedure or that particular statement be recompiled for each execution. So there's all these options, like you can create a stored procedure with recompile, and that causes every execution to be recompiled. Mm -hmm. Well, if the stored procedure is really large, that can be very expensive. So instead, if there's one, as I tend to call it, one offending, um, oh, to, to, I'm reading, sorry, I was reading a, a comment that says totally preach on, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, I'm not meaning to preach, but you're right. Uh, stern procedures are, are definitely something that need to be uh, understood, and, and a little bit of preaching here, I guess, is necessary. But um, so the stored procedure that that has wildly different plans, you don't want to keep the the plan. So, like I said, you can create it with recompile, but the problem with creating it with recompile is the whole thing gets recompiled, and that in and of itself can be expensive. So imagine you have, you know, more than one line of code in a stored procedure. Go figure, right? So you have like four, hmm. 400 lines of code. Well, if you just want one line of code to be recompiled, there's no way to do that today, hint, hint. There will be a new con, statement-based recompilation. Mm -hmm. But today, if there's a statement that you want to recompile, there's really two ways to do it. Now, one way is dynamic string execution, which, which is a pain in the butt. I mean, it really is. It's ugly to write. It's, it's prone to potentially SQL injection errors if it's not really well tested, mm -hmm. right? And it also has problems in terms of requirements, security. If you have a string in, in dynamic string execution, then the person executing the procedure has to have rights to execute what's in the string, right. which is SQL Server's security way of minimizing you getting away with a bunch of crap you're not supposed to be able to right. do, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a good thing. But it means that you now have to give people access to base tables, which means now That's they can do good. things out, yeah. outside of your store procedure, right? Which is a nightmare. Input so, input is evil, as we've heard. Yes, and and so dynamic string execution is not my favorite. Now, I would agree that in a lot of cases, when bad plans are getting optimized, dynamic string execution might perform better, which is which is exactly kind of Rocky's point, right? Right, and some of those some of those instances might be when you have a leading wild card, for example. Exactly. Exactly, and, or you use greater than, less than, something that, that yeah. wildly varies in terms of row sets. Absolutely. Right. Okay, so, so you have all these issues, right, in terms of, of your, your data set. And you've got this one statement that's really just this nightmare. And, and by the way, if some of you are going, how do I figure out what statement is the nightmare? There's, profiler. There's, yeah, profiler. Or you can even do something called, um, st uh, oh my God, okay, this is like a quiz. Here, um, in <laughs> Query Analyzer, there's Query uh, Show Server Trace, and right. um, it's basically a mini scaled-down profiler in Query Analyzer. Now, the problem with it is you have to be a sysadmin to use it, which is, don't even start me on that one, okay? Right, but right. Um, if you're a sysadmin and you're doing testing in a development environment, then you'll be able to use this, and it basically can help you see the, the duration of all the statements and the reads and writes so if you can see a statement with, you know, wildly varying durations and reads and writes, then that's very likely to be your offending statement. So if your stored procedure is taking 45 seconds and you're not sure why, then use that. Find out why. 
then take, let's say, three or four different executions with different parameter sets and compare the show plan output of that statement in each of those executions, executing each time with recompile. So like execute per, uh, procedure parameter list with recompile with one set of parameters. Execute store procedure parameter list with recompile with a different set. You know, the first one returning, let's say, one row. The second one returning 10 rows. The th you know, test your zero, one, in many case, right? Yeah, I know. Kim, did you just say sysadmin in a dev environment? <laughs> I I did just say sysadmin in a dev environment. The the reason why I'm saying that is because this – yeah, I know. This particular tool, um, it, just that particular tool, the show server trace, does require it. Now, show execution plan doesn't. That doesn't mean that's what your code runs against. Though. No, 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 no. This is solely yeah. for – this solely for administration. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or for you for testing – on a testing server right. where you're connected as a sysadmin. Yeah. And it's just a box for under your desk, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Box under your desk, you know, you're all logged in as admin anyway. Good <laughs> point. <laughs> oh, man. Don't get me started on that, too. Yeah, let's not even go there with SA no password, I'm yeah, sure, I'm right? Yeah, sure, right. Um, no, but it, just the show server trace requires it. Now, show execution plan doesn't, and you can often do the same kind of, kind of troubleshooting using show plan, okay? So, you know, just just checking the plans to see which is the most expensive plan um, out of the batch and then, or out of the store procedure, and then seeing if the plans are consistent. Can, so, you, can you imagine having like a run as keyword in, the, in transact SQL? <laughs> well, actually, that's what it's going to be in Yukon. Oh, no way. It's, it's kind of a, and you know what? I don't remember the syntax. I don't know if it's a literal. I was joking. Run I know you were joking, um, but the the whole concept, uh, there's two things that they're really adding to store procedures, and I, I, I have to admit I haven't looked at this particular aspect of Yukon as much, but there there's two things, kind of a run as, so that you can create a store procedure that has a statement that's run as somebody else and with somebody else's privileges um, for a variety of purposes, but especially dynamic string execution. Mm -hmm. And then they also have... Uh, statement-based recompilation, and, and I don't remember the syntax for either of those, and I don't even know if they're in beta 2 or not, and I, I don't know if I'm going to get shot for having said what I just said, but anyway, you brought it up, so I'll blame you. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's all my fault. <laughs> um, so, um, okay, so in testing your stored procedure, you can see if the plans wildly vary. If the plans wildly vary, then for that one statement, what I would recommend instead of dynamic string execution, especially because it's a total pain in the ass, right, is, sorry, I just swore. Um, hey, we get in trouble for that? Par, no, it's can. par for the course. I mean, that's that's tame compared to some of the stuff we've all said. All right, all right, good. See, I, I don't swear when I'm lecturing, so I, I wasn't <laughs> See, sure. See, isn't this fun? You can <laughs> say is, pain I, in the ass. I, I'd like to be on more often now, Carl. <laughs> you right. can say, when is this bullshit? You can say that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, it, it's going to be hard for me, though. Okay, so <laughs> the, the whole stored procedure thing, you've got this one offending line of code. Right. My recommendation is to actually extract that particular kind of nasty or, or let's say, badass statement. Ooh, that felt good. <laughs> okay, so, so take that little bad boy, put him in another stored procedure, and create that sub-procedure with recompile so that that sub-procedure only has... Um, one line of code or two lines of code, for example, and it gets recompiled, but your main procedure that has 400 lines of code doesn't. Yeah. That's great advice. Yeah, and actually on my blog, one of my first blog entries, um, about, you know, and I just started blogging. In fact, you had comments on a couple of weeks ago, yeah. and I will never be able to thank him enough for blogging about my being blogless and guilting me into a <laughs> blog. In fact, you know what he did? Oh, he actually set up the blog, gave me the password, and said, okay, you need to start blogging. <laughs> wow. So I'm like, oh, shit, now I need to start blogging. So anyway, I blame, I blame that time vortex on him. But I ended up blogging about this whole, whole stored procedure business. So in one of my earlier blog entries, it's, it's there as well. So there's, there's even sample uh, code for you to kind of see it happen uh, against a sample database, which is also there. So there's there's a bunch of good stuff that you guys can use and play with. Ooh, Great. 
Don Keeley says it's the execute as syntax, and it is in beta 2. Don, you rock. Thanks. Don actually got locked out of the uh, chat room because it's not accepting any more connections. Don, you might want to try it again. Okay. Yeah, so I, I couldn't remember if it was execute as or run as or whatever, but yeah, yeah execute as. And then there's also a recompilation thing, and I, I forget what it is. But, you know, absolutely um, – Absolutely something you guys should be installing and working with is, is Beta 2, um, SQL Express, and, and watch for white papers. We've got just a ton. I've got two white papers. I'm kind of <laughs> embarrassed that I, I have not uh, finished them entirely for Beta 2, so I'm a little bit behind. That's but I've okay. got two roughly 50-page white papers coming out that are based on Beta 2. They have a bunch of code samples, a bunch of really good info on uh, snapshot isolation and table and index partitioning. And there's just tons of great resources. I'm not the only one, obviously, that's been writing white papers. So there's just such good stuff that's coming out with Beta 2. So kind of stay posted with MSDN. Stay posted with my blog as I find out where the resources go. I usually blog about them. Somebody says it's the blog at SQL Skills. On SQL Skills, left pane, it's blogs. You click on that, and it brings you to SQL Skills slash blogs. Slash Kimberly, thanks. And we'll put the link up there too, anyway. <laughs> uh, and the watch out for SQL injection attacks with execute as is a great point. Okay, you absolutely. absolutely. You know, at, at, let me give you a tip on SQL injection. Quote name. If you have only table names and column names as part of your, um, you know, dynamic string, and a lot of people do, right? They want to parameterize the table name. They want to parameterize right. a specific column name. The thing that's really cool about that is you can use quote name with those parameters to bracket them regardless of what they've submitted. And the thing that's cool is that even if they submit, like let's say, actually, have I posted this code? I think I did. Um, You know what? I'll write myself a note. If I haven't posted it, I'll blog about it either tonight or tomorrow. Okay. But um, somebody went on a, a news group and said, oh, I'm trying to allow people to create databases and I want the database name to be an option. And their syntax was create database plus the database name, right? Mm -hmm. And then all the other garbage. And their question was, I can't get this to work if they supply a database name that has spaces. And it was like, oh, God. I I didn't see that response. But then somebody made a response that said, oh, just put into the dynamic string a square bracket around the, the beginning of it and a square bracket around the end of it. And that's when I saw it, and I said, well, what if I close your square brackets and inject drop database blah? If they're doing a create database, it's very likely that they're running under the SA account, which I later found out was true. And I said, then I can do anything I want to your system. That's, that's a really bad form, obviously, of SQL injection. If you take the database name and instead put it in the quote name function, and you put quote name, the parameter, comma, and then you put what you're bracketing it with. You guys can check out quote name in the books online. But okay. um, you use brackets, and no matter what they supply, it'll properly bracket it. So you'll end up with a database name called something like junk yeah. end bracket drop database foo. Right. Exactly, yeah. But better to do that than have your databases dropped and your whole system whacked, right? That's very cool. And uh, I just want to tell everybody that this show is going to go long. Kim, I hope you can stick around for a little bit of extra time. Is that no, okay? No, I'm done with you guys. There's an RSS feed. <laughs> hey, you guys, there's an RSS feed on my, my blog. Okay. They got it. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, no, oh, the, there it is. We're, yeah, we're, having, we're having too much fun, and, and I'm, I got the feeling that everybody want, could listen to you all night. But, well, you uh, know, I have to tell you something, though. I, I'm giving a demo tomorrow for the SQL team on campus. So I'm, I'm slightly stressed, but I will stick around. I, okay. I will. Great. But I, I have a bunch of work to do. I'm doing a Yukon demo that I, I kind of want to tell you guys about. There's well, I'd like to, I'd, I'd really like to talk to you about Yukon. But you have to take a break. <laughs> well, we do have to take a break. Yes. And, uh, and this break is going to be a quick break, but it's something that we usually do around the end of the show. This hey, is Luke not. doesn't like me. He says, let her go. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sad. Let her go. Let her talk is what he <laughs> means. Not let her go. Hang up on her. <laughs> Um, this is something we do towards the end of the show, but we're, we're going to do it now and then we're going to come back and finish, uh, talking up with, uh, talking with Kimberly. So, so stick around Kim and you can participate in this too. This is called, this is a new segment we have on the show called Richard the Toy Boy. Boom. 
Richard, Richard Campbell, how you doing? Hey guys, I'm doing great, man. How are you? Awesome. Been enjoying the show? Oh, uh, well, you know, I'm a huge fan of Kim. I have been for a long time, so it's always nice to hear her doing her thing. Yeah. So Richard, you got a good toy and a not so good toy for us this week? Well, you know, I always do, but I got a few other things to talk about too. Okay. And, uh, what I want to lead off with is uh, talking about my friends at Tom Bin you know, oh, last yeah. week. We gave away a, a brain bag, which uh, is the best darn laptop bag I've ever seen anywhere. And uh, the folks at Tom Bin have offered up that bag to our uh, our winner. And they just wanted to let us know that uh, I guess they've been a little swamped. I don't know <laughs> if it was uh, the show we did on their bags, but they are totally sold out. Yeah, they're like three right weeks now. behind. Or there's a waiting list. Of... Three months oh, behind. Oh, really? Three months. Now, wow. the thing that's interesting about Tom Bin is they actually make their bags in Port Angeles, Washington. They're not made offshore. They're made locally. And so that's one of the reasons the quality is untouchable. The quality of material, the zippers, everything they do in those bags is absolutely the best stuff. And that's why it's taken a while to get more made up. As uh, they're getting more popular, it is taking longer and longer to get it done. Hmm. So uh, we're going to have to wait a little while to deliver that prize, but it will come. And I highly recommend if you want one of those bags, www.tombin, T-O-M-B-I-H-N.com. Uh, the brain bag is the best you'll ever find. And as a matter of fact, we uh, they they are footing the bill for the prize, aren't they? Yes, they are. They're, yeah. they're actually giving us the prize. So uh, our prize winner will be uh, able to feed in what laptop they've got. They'll get them an appropriate insert for their bag and send them out a brain bag. That's just and, incredible. Uh, thanks very much to, uh, to Sunga over at uh, Tom Bin for making that happen for us. Yeah, that was great. Very generous of them. Usually we buy these toys ourselves with our sponsor money, and uh, and it was just very nice for them to step up to the plate and, and offer that uh, bag. Excellent. And by the way, you know, Jeff was talking about on the last show, that label inside the bag in French. It said, it oh, said yeah, something right. along the lines right. of, uh, we're sorry, our President Bush is an idiot. We uh, right. we didn't vote for him. <laughs> yeah. And it's in French. Yeah, it's in French. I found it in my bag. Really? It's really in the bag. Really? It's sewed into the bag. It truly is. <laughs> Every single one of them. So, yeah, it's wow. a strange bunch of guys up Something about being on the Olympic Peninsula makes you a little crazy, I think. Right. Anyway, hey, let's talk about this week's couple of toys. And they're related. You're going to love this. The first thing I want to talk about is a really great toy that I think we're all going to want because the price can't be beat. And let's face it, more is better. And I'm talking about the new generation of dual layer DVD and DVD burners. Oh, yeah. Now... There's a several companies that are manufacturing right now, but I'm a big LG fan. So let me lead you to LG. You can take a look at this thing. The uh, the URL is us.lge.com. So this gets us to LG Electronics. And they make all kinds of things, including DVD burners. Uh, so the trick is to find this thing is to get into the drop down for hot products and select DVD writers. Oh, yeah. And... Front and center, right at the top of the page, is the GSA 4120B. Now, this is the most over-the-top burner you're ever going to see. I know the box looks the same. It's just another drive. But we're talking about a drive that can read and write DVDs, read and write CDs and CDRWs, every kind of format you can think of, including most of the non-cooperative DVD formats, DVD right. plus R, DVD minus R, all these different options. But the big thing here is they're finally selling dual layer burners. Now, go with me on this. Hard this is find. voodoo as far as I'm concerned. Yep. I mean, it's crazy what they're doing here. Inside of a one and a half millimeter thick DVD, there are actually two different stratas of burning layers. So you get about four and a half, four and a quarter gigs on each layer. That's insane. And they're all on one side of the disc. And they, they do it by focusing the laser at a different level inside of the disc. So it's a plus or minus one quarter of a millimeter to make that work. Wow. That's insane. Now it's nutty enough that <laughs> really? this drive works the way it does. Yeah, it's amazing that it does work. And so the these will these DVDs, the dual layer DVDs, they're what, 10 gigs? Will they play in conventional DVD players, like consumer grade? DVD players like yes they will well dual layer reading is not that unusual but dual layer writing that is unusual so you hmm. should be okay 
at working okay. with these things. And it's one sided. So we're talking about two layers on the same side. So you don't have to flip the disc or anything wacky like right, that. Right. Wild. The re- and, the, and the real, in- when you actually get down to the brass tacks, it actually will record a little less than eight gigabytes per disc or about four hours of MPEG 2. Wow. What, uh, what, um, how much is that thing? Now, there's the kicker. A, a year ago, actually about six months ago, this was a $1,000 device. Wow. Right now, if you go to a place like buy.com or CDW or any of these, we'll find these for about 100 bucks. No kidding. <laughs> that's it, 100 bucks. And that's not because they suck. <laughs> no, it's because they're, they've stopped trying to hack for the price, and they're, they're knocking them down, and they're getting cheap. Wow. And the velocity downloads are serious. Wow. The, uh, Apparently, media is hard to find, though, right? Yeah. Now, the dual layer media is tough to come by, and it's not that cheap. Yeah. You you are you're talking about a buck a piece uh, or better. Wow. But and the uh, the bottom line is this is the way these things are going to go, and we're going to see more and more drives like this, and the capacities are just going to keep going up. Very cool. There's more to come. I mean, if there's any yeah. reason the price went down, it's probably because there's something bigger and better coming. But True. That's inevitable in the toy world. So uh, we're going to give away one of these and uh, and a few uh, maybe a ten pack of uh, media. Absolutely, I think that's a perfect gift. But I'm okay. going to give out the uh, what you the pro, what you got to do to get the prize. But before we do that, here we go. <laughs> we need to talk about another toy. All right, what is the uh, horrible and toy of the week here? This is a toy that well, I don't know. Well, y- you know the nice thing about it, the URL says it all. Okay, and it really makes sense when you're going to be looking at a device like this LG drive. You got to look at one of these and consider how badly you need it. Are you ready? Go ahead. www.dvdrewinder.com. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. You can buy a DVD rewinder. In fact, they're sold out of DVD rewinders. They're all gone. You've got to wait to get a DVD rewinder. I don't know why I don't find these in more video stores. Because I hate rewinding my DVDs. It just takes so much time. I'd pay a fee. How much do they sell for? They're 30 bucks. 30 bucks. Yeah, it's 100 bucks for the drive, 30 bucks to rewind the discs. That is awesome. But you get, you'll get a discount if you buy them in bulk. Oh, I could get one for my mother. She looked, yep. she'd, be, she'd be calling me up for tech support. Does she always you, forget you, to rewind her DVDs? You know, there was a wireless network cable for sale on eBay. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, Richard, that's great. It's it's bad enough that somebody made these, yeah. but a whole bunch of people bought them. That's what disturbs me. Mm. Well, Richard, how is somebody going to win one of these things? All right. As I, I always make people work a bit. They've got to take a good long look. Somebody was asking a question, does the DVD rewinder work on the double layer DVD? <laughs> no, it only rewinds one of the layers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. All right. Head back to the, uh, the LG site, <laughs> and I need you to find me out a very special, specific piece of information. Okay. If you want to burn a dual layer DVD plus R, which is the typical one we're going to want to burn, it's going to burn at the slowest write speed. Okay, dual layer does not burn that fast. So go take a look at that LG site and tell me what is the slowest write speed of a DVD plus R, and you'll win yourself a drive and a pack of discs. And send your Answers to .NET rocks at franklins.net, and we will wait for the first person to accurately give us that answer. And you will win an LG dual layer DVD writer and 10 media pack. Nothing yet. You're listening to the funky sounds of the Franklin Brothers right here. Instrumental version of uh, one of their songs. Appropriately called No Time to Live.
and we have a winner. And the winner is Wedgie Man. Wedgie Man. Yay. Round of applause for Wedgie Man. Congratulations. Whoa. Congratulations. And uh, does anybody know Wedgie Man's real name? Well, I don't know. Wedgie Man, send us your uh, mailing address and your, uh, you know, your mailing address. Send it to .NET Rocks at Franklin's Net, and we'll surely send you out one of those things right there. Congratulations, man. And Richard, thank you very much. My pleasure, guys. See that you was, next week. That was great. And uh, 39 speakers later. in my living room. NASA complaints. Richard the Toy Boy. Sonic ladies and gentlemen. Boom, 10 foot screen, 20 feet wide. All right. So we were just having this incredibly fascinating discussion with Kimberly Tripp. And as sometimes happens on the show, we go a little bit long. And I think this is going to be one of those times because it seems like there's not enough time to talk about all the things that that she can uh, talk about, and uh, and so there you go. So UConn, Kimberly. UConn. UConn rocks, huh? Uh, you know, there's there's a ton of great features that I've been having uh, a lot of fun with, and there's even more that I haven't even looked at. So I'm I'm kind of embarrassed to say that that I'm kind of incredibly deep in a couple of areas, and and not even aware of numerous things. But it's a huge product, and and you know, I was saying this earlier, I think that's why I I still enjoy this so much is I, I learn something new every day and I can't be an expert in the entire product anymore. I mean back in <laughs> four two it was great, but gosh, now it's right. it's you know, I, I specialize and I, I tend to focus on performance tuning and availability and even that's really hard. Yeah. So it's 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 a lot of fun. So yeah, Yukon's great. I'm there's some features that are just Jeff Zurel says, is Yukon still geared towards X query? I don't even know what that means. What does that mean? It's going to be a big download on Monday, but a good one. Um, <laughs> well, there, see now there, okay, so XML, X query. Um, oh, XML query, okay. Yeah, having, having XML that can be indexed, um, great new features of Yukon, and I, I, to be really honest, I haven't really done that much with, with the whole XML aspect of Yukon. You can pretty much be certain that XML is a central part of, XML features are a central part of what Yukon's all about. Oh, I can, yeah, you can pretty much but, be sure about that. But it's not the answer to every everybody or, or every environment. Right. I, I mean, I still see databases that don't use any in any way, shape, or form, depending on what their clients are and what their needs are. Sure. So, so it's it's not necessarily everywhere, but um, yes, Yukon definitely has a ton of of XML X query. I, I you know you guys should have on somebody that's a real XML guru, and I I can I bet somebody on the SQL team would would be more than happy, even a group of them, to come on and and do like an evening. Yeah, event. and and from the uh, from the turnout we're getting, it sounds like that'd be a very popular show as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah totally. The the whole data team. So, anyone you would recommend? Off the top of my head, no, but um, okay. I'm I'm writing that down as well, and I I will get you I will get you okay, multiple sure. people and anyone else them. anyone else who has a suggestion for that matter of any guest that they would like to see on Dot Rox, you can send it to Dot Rox at Franklin's Dot Net. Anyway, go ahead. Was that for me? Yeah. yeah. Are you going ahead for me? Go um, ahead. Okay, so. Let me see if I can I can summarize a, a few interesting things. Um, well, the tools. I'll, I'll start with with the tools. There's a lot of interesting things that they've done. Like I'll give you a couple of my little, uh, seemingly insignificant, but I think are interesting. Filtering. If you have a, a huge number of stored procedures, there's a way that you can basically click on uh, your stored procedure list, create a filter, and then obviously only see those objects and you know, with databases that have 1,300 views, it becomes really helpful to, to quickly just say filter, see the subset of views that you're interested in, go and work with, manipulate those, and then either go back to the regular view or change your filter to something else. So, you know, that's, that's, okay. that's definitely something that's useful. Probably my absolute favorite thing in the UI, whenever I was trying to figure out what the heck was going on with Enterprise Manager, and I'm sure none of you have ever really needed that, right? Oh, yeah, I know. You'd, never. Yeah, you'd throw it's up. It's a perfect tool, um, and we know exactly what it does at all times. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, and you'd throw up Profiler, right? And you'd end up profiling Enterprise Manager, but even then, if you had lots of activity going on, it was hard to kind of decipher which was you and so forth. 
you could create filters and profiler, don't get me wrong, but it was a lot of work. Um, what they've done, which I think is, is probably one of the best features of Enterprise Manager or the new SQL Workbench, really, or which is now called the SQL Management Studio. I really have to get it right, don't I? <laughs> um, is every single dialogue you can basically run or you can click script. And um, what it will basically do is take the code that that dialogue would have executed and throw you into another window. And cool. it's awesome. You know, and it's even... For those of you that like to build scripts, like one of the, one of my favorite new features is SQL CMD, mm -hmm. um, which is basically the re the replacement plus of OSQL, which allows variables. And like even today, so I'm I'm working on this demo that I'm doing uh, tomorrow, and one of the things that that I decided to do was kind of create a generic script, a generic SQL CMD executable that would take a database from a 2000 server and then restore it over to my Yukon server, changing paths and renaming all the data files and all that crap, which, you know, you can do that pretty easily with Backup Restore, but I basically just wanted to be able to point to a database, pull it over, and be done with it. And um, I, I created scripting variables. You can even create a, an initialization script so that whenever you bring up SQL CMD, it by default goes and queries your environment, like what server you're connecting to, things like that. Nice. In, oh, and this is really cool, too. In SQL CMD scripts, you can even say colon connect and create another connection to another server and basically be bouncing back and forth between different uh, servers and different connections. And it's just, it's awesome. It's, it's, it's T-SQL, but with environment variables, with different types of connection abilities with parameterization. And my favorite, this was really cool with SQL CMD, is if you parameterize something. So let, let's say you want to put in the database that you want to copy between the two servers. Mm -hmm. Well, what you can do is put that then into a string, even dynamic string execution, and they'll do the replacement of the parameters before they get to any of the SQL code. So you can actually have parameters even within strings even within dynamic string execution. Wow. So anyway, I'm kind of kind of babbling. It's very cool. And if if I kind of get the green light to post <laughs> some of my uh, beta two stuff, which actually I, I don't think I'll have any problem with that, I'll start posting a bunch of a bunch of stuff very soon. So Is, it, uh, just yeah. some really. Uh, and then as far as features, table index uh, table and index partitioning is just oh, IntelliSense is not there, by the way. Um, whoever really? just Yeah, IntelliSense was whacked. Um, they uh. had some issues with IntelliSense. Um, SQL Express has IntelliSense. Is that, is that the SQL? Really? It's, it's been pulled from Workbench, and same with the outlining feature and so forth. So interesting that it's hmm. there. I, I, I don't think it's going to make it back in Workbench, but it's hopeful that it will. Um, Oh, well, that's still anyway, early. I mean, yeah, it's relatively. still early. We still have, you know, SQL 2008. We've got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Oh, God, I'm going to get in trouble for that one, aren't I? Um, well, you know, everybody, they know that we're anxious and we want it now. And, you know, that's yeah, the way we are. It's a huge release <laughs> and it's got so many great features. Like, for those of you that are, are Oracle DBAs, Oracle programmers, probably one of the most interesting for you guys is Snapshot Isolation. There's going to be a lot of confusion out there, though, on Snapshot because there's actually two forms of Snapshot isolation. So now, w Define that for us. Yeah, okay. So it's basically readers don't block writers. And, oh, interesting. Yeah, and you can get statement level or transaction level read consistency, meaning hmm. depending on the setting that you set for Snapshot, you can basically run a SQL statement and... Everything that you see in the bounds of that SQL statement will be based on what it looked like when essentially that SQL statement started. And you'll get a statement level read consistent view. Mm. And a lot of people are probably out there right now saying, I didn't know that SQL Server didn't have statement level yeah, read consistency. Yeah, right. It seems like it should. Um, it, it seems like it should, but and the likelihood of, of significant problems in a lot of cases with the fact that it doesn't is is rare, but for extremely long running statements, it is definitely a problem, um, and it, it can definitely be an issue. But it's a performance trade off in right. the you know historically. So, but with Yukon, um, you can ask for this, 
and you do pay a penalty in terms of performance to get mm-hmm. this. So mm-hmm. I, I would basically say that you really need to do some testing. I would recommend reading the white paper. I would recommend, you know, getting out on the news groups, checking out, uh, you know, different resources before you go and just blindly implement Snapshot everywhere. What but is, yeah. go ahead. What does your test environment look like? I mean, do you have like several boxes that you, <laughs> I mean, I'm just curious. What is, you know, what's Kimberly Tripp's house look like? Well, I've got five in my office right here where I'm sitting, uh-huh. um, two of which are, are laptops, each of which has two hard drives, which are dual boot between Windows 2003 and, and XP. Okay. And then I've got 2000 as well, and then I've got a couple of other XP machines. And I, I you know, I, I try to, to set up as many things as I can to kind of play, but right. I also use instances. I mean, one of my favorite features of 2000 yeah. of of having multiple instances, my laptop that I, I normally take to conferences has five instances on it. Right. And each one is a different service pack, plus I've got kind of a, a junk instance, right? So right. I can mess with it, trash it, whatever. So, yeah, I, I lots of hard drives is basically my office with, yeah. with lots of... I, I, go I would on like to see if Richard's closet and your, so your, your office, you know, how they would match up. <laughs> oh, I think, well, actually, my friends call me Gadget Girl, so I do have, I do, you know, Toy Boy and Gadget Girl. Toy Boy Girl. and Gadget Girl, right. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, I definitely have a lot of gadgets. There's no doubt about it. Richard says, sounds like the Toy Boy needs to pay a visit to Gadget Girl's place. <laughs> I think this should be a different show, in fact. <laughs> One that might not be uh, ready for prime time. <laughs> Yeah, I, and now the adventures of Toy Boy and Gadget Girl. <laughs> when last we saw Toy Boy, he was slunking along the street looking for his Wi-Fi seeker, which he dropped uh, on the way to Radio Shack to pick up some transistors. Okay, uh, let's 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 <laughs> let's get irritated about Radio Shack for a moment. Does it not drive everybody crazy that they want your freaking name, address, and firstborn to buy a? Battery? They finally buy stopped batteries. doing that. Yeah. They I finally they stopped, stopped doing, doing that. that. Yeah. Yeah, What's but yeah, it drove me insane for about ten years, and and every time I went in there just to get like a wire, and I would come home and get ten mailings from Radio Shack. I hated that. I I'm glad you brought that up. I I, I always say I'm homeless. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have your address, please? I'm homeless. Uh, that's awesome. I'm going to use that if I get that again. It's like somebody came I up call to that, me. On... I call that uh, identity raping. <laughs> right. Right. Somebody came up I to me on the street today on the way down. Jeff and I um, went down to the Indian restaurant to get a bite to eat tonight. And uh, on the way, this guy comes up to us and says, hey, buddy, you got 50 cents? And I looked at him as we passed and I said, yep. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't, but I wanted to. I wanted to, didn't I, Jeff? Okay, so what were we talking about anyway? So you guys think Richard will win? He probably will. He probably will win Toy Boy versus Gadget Girl. I'm not sure. I don't know. I think it'll be I, close. Well, anyway, um, so UConn. So, okay. you're, are you much of a of a classic programmer, or are you all T SQL? Um, do you do any development other than you know Windows so apps or web apps other than T SQL? It's funny that that you say that. I I historically have always said. I don't care what you do with the data, but I'll serve it up quickly. You know what I mean? I, no, seriously. I, I mean, my... Alice, my, pick up! <laughs> you know, I, I tend to look at the back-end server, and I, I really don't necessarily care where the data comes from or where the data is going, but right. I really am changing my tune. Um, okay. I'm starting to, to, to... When I go to tech ed, when I go to these events, I'm starting to attend other people's sessions. I'm starting to, to you know, I, I went to Pat Helen's session, Clement mm-hmm. Vaster's session, uh, Don Box's sessions, um, you know, Michelle Bustamante's session. So, I mean, I just tried to kind of get as much as I can. I, I've had a few lessons in, in C Sharp, which actually I, I wasn't having any problem with C Sharp, really. It's the .NET frameworks that I really think is is not overwhelming, but it's freaking overwhelming. Yeah, I mean, it is. Well, what so, do you, yeah, no, go ahead. So, so, so historically, no. I think the last program that I wrote end to end as a program was like in VB two or something obnoxious. I mean, it was probably ten years ago. Um, but I, I do tend to do a lot of client application integration. I, but no, no. I, I it's mostly back end server, stored procedures, table design, 
indexing, availability, backup, restore, disaster recovery. Do you feel you like know, you're kind of getting? Do you feel like you're kind of getting pushed into development because the CLR is now hosted in Yukon? I'm pushing myself, but you know, quite honestly, I I don't think that every DBA is going to have to be pushed into the CLR because of Yukon. I, yeah. I think that's that good. They need, good to hear, actually. Yeah, I think that they need to be aware of what it means to run CLR-based procedures, and they have to consider the different security aspects of them. And they should get very familiar with with you know when they allow CLR-based procedures, where they're coming from, and right. how well they've been tested, and what kind of mode they run in. And, right. and I don't even know all the details of this, but there's different levels. Uh, in which you can run the the procedures, and those are something that I hope that people study. But being able to read all the code and being able to write all the code, I don't think that's going to be something all DBAs need to to, yeah. to do. And I think some DBAs think I need to write all my stored procedures in T SQL. T SQL is dead, and that is far that's from it. That's just wrong. I, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite features in the T SQL area is uh, what are called CTEs, Common Table Expressions. Not like any of you have ever had to traverse a hierarchy or a bill of materials, parent-child relationship, never. right? No, <laughs> never. Never. Well, yeah, CTEs. Yeah, set-based data. Yeah, yeah, you know, what a concept. But it, it, you can actually do this thing called common table expressions where you can reuse a query multiple times and, and at multiple levels within your query. And there's actually already been some white papers on T-SQL enhancements written by ITSIC that are like 60 pages long. So people that say that T-SQL is dead are just, they're wrong. T-SQL is being enhanced. It's much easier to do much more complex queries. Row versions and row numbers, I should say row numbers and ranking functions. There's some great features there. Um, it, it, so no, T-SQL is not dead. It, you don't have to write anything really in the CLR, but where things are incredibly cumbersome, incredibly computationally focused, for example, um, complex string manipulation in some right. cases. There you go. That's great for the CLR. If you wrote right. uh, OA create uh, stored procedures or XPs, that stuff should be getting moved over. But boy, data access set oriented is in most cases the way to go. It, it's usually a hell of a lot faster. So actually, and I know we're getting close to the end on what we thought we would yeah. do, but hey, let me add one more thing. Functions. Like a lot of people think that Functions rock, and don't get me wrong. Scalar functions are a great addition. But like, I where was I? It was at SQL Pat. No, it wasn't. It was at uh, SQL Magazine Connections uh, just a few months ago. Somebody came out to me before I was going to do a session that I call Follow the Rabbit. My mm -hmm. idea for Follow the Rabbit was, you guys start asking questions, and I'll just be tangent, you know, land. I'll go wherever you guys want to go. And I figured if nobody asked me questions, I better have something, right? Mm -hmm. So I did a few slides, and one of the slides was. Our scalar functions always the best way to go. So like the morning of, I said, you know, I'm going to create a cool demo for this. And I did a scalar function that took in a member number and returned the person's name, right? Mm -hmm. Real simple. Mm -hmm. And I wrote that as then a query against the member table. And I, I instead of pulling it and concatenating first name and last name from the query, I had the function do it, which meant for each row, it had to then go back to the table to pull that value. So it was, it was horribly slow. Mm -hmm. That wasn't so bad. But then I decided to do a join against a charge table with 1.6 million rows. So for each charge, instead of joining to member to get all the member names in one set-oriented join, right, it was taking each charge looking up the member number, each charge looking up the member number, each charge wow. looking up the member number. So I ran it with a join, and it took 270 milliseconds. Mm -hmm. And then I figured I'll run this live and show people how bad it is, thinking it was going to be three or four minutes. Thank God I didn't run it live. I ran it that morning. It took 43 minutes to wow. run with the function. Wow. So, so you're looking at, I mean, this is, this is orders of magnitude. I mean, 270 milliseconds versus, uh, you know, 43 minutes. That's insane. And it's insane. And, and I guess my point is that a set-oriented or a join that is, is written with optimal data access patterns can often outweigh and outperform row-based types of operations by orders of magnitude. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going to see the same thing happen with the CLR. It's going to get missed. That's going to be bad, of course, because the first thing a VBNet program is going to do is for I equals one to, you know. The file do begin stuff, yeah. Count from 
table where blah blah blah. Yeah, that's just yeah, gonna the old suck. X base. X base return. Right. So speaking of bad ideas, and this would be the last thing before we go. Um, what what kinds of big mistakes are you anticipating people to be making with Yukon because they can? Ah, that's a great question. What kind of mistakes do I think people are going to make with Yukon? Because, well, I, I have to admit they've, they've done a lot in terms of off by default. So the good news is, is there's a lot of things that you can't do because a lot of stuff is just off yeah. um, by default. I, so that's the good news. I, I think some features are going to get abused, like CLR. Right. I think people are going to turn on potentially things like Snapshot where it may not be appropriate. Something I made a point of in the white paper was, you know, if you're not having these problems and you turn on snapshot, then you might actually get worse performance. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it's snapshot isolation tends to, to really help where concurrency and contention and readers blocking writers, writers blocking readers is, right. is your major performance bottleneck. But if that's not it, if your performance problems are because you don't have indexes, then turning on snapshot creates row versions and overhead that's not necessary. So while I think there's great features and while I think they've done an incredible job addressing a lot of the needs that are out there, I think that some things are going to get turned on without, let's say, enough enough research and enough testing. And, and maybe that's what I think is going to be the biggest problem is just people going wild implementing features without fully understanding their, impl you know, their implications of them. And Joe from the website says, are there any features that you don't like? <laughs> Or that you feel is an indication SQL Server is going in the shitter. <laughs> Here's your chance to rank on it. So. Wow, wow. Or um, suggestion for improvement, let's say it that way. <laughs> there's, there's tons of areas for improvement, but that's, you know, that's the whole point of there being a next release, the Yukon Plus One, you know, in SQL yeah. Server 2094. So that was somewhat funny. <laughs> yeah, it was a little funny. They just want to, you know, they just want to see people kill their careers. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't know. I, I, I tend to focus on the stuff that I'm going to use and I'm going to need. And if it's not there, I kind of say, all right, I'll find some other way around it. Yeah. And I don't, I don't, I don't piss and moan as much, right. I suppose, as, as uh, maybe that's a. Well, but then again, Kim, I mean, you've worked with SQL so long and so intimately that you really understand how it works internally, whereas. You know, the majority of people who use it don't have that benefit, and so they can't. And that's the thing. You know, that's why you know when to cluster an index, and you know when to index this and not index that, and to, to use a store procedure here and dynamic SQL there, and you know, and the, just that kind of knowledge is amassed because you used it so much. Yeah, so. that 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 does help. I mean, it really gives me, in in a lot of cases, perspective that right. that I kind of know where it came from and maybe why something is is doing something the way that it is as opposed to just, you know, how. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, it's, uh, it's getting late here, so we better wrap it up. Is there any, uh, last minute, uh, uh, things that you want to talk about or last minute statements or, uh, wisdom to impart on the listening audience? Just audience? beta two, if you haven't started working with Yukon is a great place to start. Start looking for resources on MSDN, Start checking out blogs. A lot of the, the SQL team is out there and blogs. I've got some links in my blog role. I've got um, – there's, there's tons of stuff out there, I guess. And my, my point is the more that you start learning now, um, not necessarily implementing, but the more you start learning now, I think the better you'll be when it does ship and, and you'll be ready for the right features in the right implementation and you'll, you'll get better performance. So Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, you're welcome. Actually, I was really nervous, and this, this was really fun. Well, I'll do this again. Yeah, you'll definitely have to come back. Well, I want to uh, thank my uh, thank Rory. Rory had to take off. He uh, had some prior he had some prior commitments that he couldn't uh, get out of, and he had to take off. But uh, I'd like to thank Jeff Maciolik out there, the Sound Monkey, all the people who showed up in the chat room, and and everything else, and. Make sure you tune in next week for my guest is going to be, uh, and Rory's guest is going to be Miguel de Acaza, Miguel de Acaza uh, from the Mono team. And what can I say? .NET rocks, and thanks for listening.